All right, everyone. Hope you're all doing good today. Hope you're all doing well. We are back with another episode of Speedruns from the Crypt. It is your bi-weekly horror hotfix. Welcome back, everyone, and hope you've all been doing good. So, tonight's theme. As you notice, we have a new show ahead of us, Arcade Pits. And, you know, retro games are always fun, so I thought, as a result, why not hop into some retro horror? Uh, before we do begin tonight, I do want to mention there is a slight change of plans. Uh, originally, I was not uh, expecting myself to run. Uh, however, we did have some complications with one of our runners, so they'll be on the following show, which we'll find something to fit in with that. But uh, I just heads up, the games we have in store today are some retro classics from the PS1, Game Boy Color, and uh, the Super Nintendo or Super Famicom. Uh, funny enough, the other game was also on the Super Famicom, which the other game was going to be Super Ghosts and Goblins. Uh, I think it's a fun time and kind of a neat area of horror you don't normally get. Uh, but again, that'll be on in about two weeks. Uh, anyway, to kick things off and diving into some retro fun, we're going to be having Punchy doing Kudelka. Take it away. Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Punchy. We'll be doing Koldelka today, which is a cool horror RPG kind of blend. Uh, we take the role of the titular Koldelka, who is called to a monastery in Wales because she is psychic. She is called by, like, the voice of a ghost. I'm establishing this quickly for reasons that will become obvious as soon as I hit new game. So, three, two, one, play ball. So we are Koldelka. We commune with the spirits. We are called to a monastery in Wales. I'm dancing around the name so I don't know how to pronounce it. Abba Swift, I think, something like that. Abba Eastwith, Welsh. So Kordoka is one of these really cool RPGs that hits the ground running immediately because you start with a fight, like, instantly. I have a gun. So Kordoka is a strategy RPG of sorts. Things function on a grid-based movement system where distance between you and the enemy affect damage and what have you. But for this first fight, we are just going to shoot the gun and hope we roll nicely on damage numbers. Oh lord, he moving in. Nah, I got a gun. What are you gonna do? He's casting. So you can move and do an action in a turn. Moving is always a separate action from, like, doing gun. So we pass our movements because we don't really want to move by trying to escape and you can't escape from boss fights. Four shot, that's good. Neat. That's Cordelka. I don't know if that's actually a real name. Sounds fake to me. What's the item drop? Antidote 4. That's not very useful at all. The item you get there is random. You can potentially get very useful status heals here. We pick up our second party member almost immediately, Edward. He's a young treasure hunter kind of guy. He's come to the monastery because he thinks there's cool stuff here. Uh, that's his spiel. So now we're going to explore the monastery a bit. We have realized very quickly that it is full of ghosts and nasties. But as you can see, the controls are also very uh, Resident Evil-ish. It's a tank control game with the pre-rendered backgrounds. Kodoka doesn't know how stairs work. Into this room. We find a nice couple who uh, feed Kodoka and Edward some bread and soup. Kordelka does not partake of the soup. Edward does. Why is there a weird old couple being nice to people inside of a monastery full of monsters? Edward doesn't find this very... doesn't find this worth questioning. Immediately following this, uh, there is a cutscene where it is revealed that Edward is poisoned, Kordelka makes fun of him, and then heals him anyway. He's like, you're stupid. You're a stupid guy. One of the things that sets Kordelka apart from a lot of other contemporary RPGs is that the protagonists do not like each other at all. So, first major pain point of the run, we would like weapons. But weapons in this game generate with completely random elements, and only about half of them are playable. <laughs> we will see what we got here. There are four elements and like a handful of special types. We will see what we got. I would like normal and air pipe. Air, that is playable, I think. I'm gonna go with it. We would prefer fire and water because that plays into the relevant weaknesses of the upcoming boss fights. But normal and air, I think, is a playable combination. 
there's weapon types like uh, light, which doesn't work on anything. It just heals enemies. Except for very particular undead enemies. If you roll that, unplayable, reset. I prepared backup saves for this, if you're wondering. There's also Mystic, which doesn't do health damage. It does uh, MP damage, which also useless. Reset that. <laughs> Can't work with this. Cannot work under these conditions. But Normal and Air, a playable pair. So here's a plant boss. He's weak to fire, shockingly. Burn. So we're going to have Edward run up front and plonk him on the bonkers with his pipe. Did Kordelka get silenced, or was that Edward? I don't care if Edward gets silenced, he isn't a magic caster. Yeah, it was Edward. No, don't attack. Magic. Use your flair. Edward's taking a lot of damage. I'm not sure I like that. Onk. Kordelka's cast should kill, I think. Quite shocking. It <laughs> is like twenty seven health. Oh boy, RPG runs are currently occurring. It is an RPG. Now nah, we got this. It's fine. It's fine. I try to convince myself or the audience. Who knows? But okay, we won our first actual boss fight, and now we get to do level ups. We will increase Cordoka's intelligence and her agility. We will increase Edward's dexterity and agility. Agility determines how many turns you get. If your agility is like very, very high, you can get multiple turns. And intelligence determines magic damage. Now we pick up the third party member of the game, and also the last one of the game, James. James is a priest who has come to the monastery to find a secret document that he is not very forthcoming with the details of. All of these characters, they hate each other. They spend the entire game, like, at each other's throats, which is very fun. I just think it's refreshing to play an RPG where all of the protagonists just do not like each other. Okay, now that we have... James in tow. James can have the leftover weapon, the normal hammer. We will form the formation. Formation thus formed. We want to be forward because being forward lets us hit stuff in the head more. This is a random encounter. Do I take this? Thinking. We need to raise James's level to two before... We get to the next boss, and yeah, well, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna apply gun to the problem, I think. Then we have to use the wait command to wait, instead of trying to pass our turn by running away, because in random encounters, running away actually works, and we don't want to run away. Ooh, little crawly man. Miss! Uh, that's actually a misnomer, that's not a miss. There are no random misses in Cold Elka, it's not a thing. That actually means that the enemy's uh, dexterity or whatever stat it is that determines that was so low it couldn't hit Edward. That's one of the things that's nice about running this as an RPG. There are no random misses. If an attack's gonna hit, it like, it will hit. There's, there's no way to just randomly not hit stuff. What is this fight music? So the music of this game was composed by Hiroki Kikuta, who mainly worked before this game on the Secret of Mana game, the Mana games in general. Ooh, I found nine antidotes. So he is a man with a background in, like, fantasy RPG music. Hence why the soundtrack is like... He's also the director of the game, as it happens. Kuldelka was very much his baby. going to pick up a cool hidden weapon behind this painting, assuming the game will let me interact with it. That dirk is for Koldelka because it rather inexplicably buffs intelligence, which we need for magic damage. We don't actually plan on stabbing anything with that sword. That's for magic damage.
Our protagonists in this room, they are shot at by an unseen assailant. Uh, James tries to peek his head out to get a better look, and the other two are like, what are you doing? You're going to get shot in the head. And now I'd like to force an encounter here. You can force an encounter, it's specifically in the PAL version of the game, which is what I'm playing. Opening and closing the menu forces encounter logic to advance, so you can get encounters faster by doing that. Ooh, interesting. So armor guy over here has the potential to drop a random piece of armor for me, which I would appreciate very much. It would come in handy. Plonk on one. Very nice, very nice. Plonkum one. That is not going to kill. It did not back. Ouch. James is paralyzed. That's unfortunate. Nah, Kodoka's got the shots. Right, this should get James to level two. So I can increase his agility by four, which will give him nice extra turns in the coming boss fights. Just as planned. No drop. Sad. Okay, so now we advance on to the idols fight. Three gems. They have a corresponding elemental weakness. Uh, it's not always intuitive. The green one is weak to earth for whatever reason. We're going to open by having Kodelka cast Fortify Vitality on the red guy. Uh, something that the game doesn't make especially clear is that Fortify spells buff allies, it buffs their stats when used on them, but it also debuffs enemies when you use it on them. So if you debuff an enemy's vitality, you are decreasing their max HP. So against bulky dudes like the red guy, he's got twice as much health as the green and blue enemies. It is more efficient, damage-wise, than actually just trying to attack them directly, at least for now. Since I am not carrying an elemental weakness weapon, that's something you can just randomly have or not have. Again, if we had fire and water here, I'd be laughing. Because you can just really go in on them. Uh, I have air and... I have air and normal. Which does make things simple. Because they don't resist any of those. Actually, no, green dude resists air. Hmm. Let's beat up on blue first then, shall we? That probably silenced Koldelka, meaning I can't do Fortify Vitality a second time. That's a very common outcome. Decreasing max HP just sounds like damage with extra steps. Hmm. True, but what I mean by that is that if damage is dealt to them already, you don't do like... Like, decreasing their max HP if they've already taken damage doesn't isn't as efficient. I'm not explaining this very well. Hit the blue guy with the blunt object. Uh, this might kill. Very nice. That's one guy out. You can't move past enemies in the grid. If there is an enemy in, like, one of the rows, you can't advance past that row. So the red guy in the back is currently secure until green dude is knocked out. Nice damage. Ooh, actually, the silence wore off. I'm going to go for it, then. Haha, <laughs> no vitality for you. Uh, 
Hmm. They've moved backwards, meaning Edward can now attack the red guy. I would prefer Edward to do this because the green guy resists his weapon, so it's like less efficient damage-wise. I am splitting my attacks by doing this, but it's probably... But weapons have weapon durability in this game, so it's probably better to do efficient strikes than necessarily to pile damage onto the one target. Because if the weapon breaks, uh, I'm going to have to improvise a lot. It's not random, fortunately. But it means I do have to be a bit a bit careful about overly using one character. Gun. Now Kordoka's just gonna sit here and shoot. She has like no physical damage at all and will not for the entire game. We are building her to be a caster. Reloading your gun sadly takes a turn. Oh, that killed. I was not expecting that to kill. James can't quite get into position this turn. If this fight seems like it's going on a while, that's probably because this is the most variable of the early game fights. Honk. There we go. That was fine. If you get, like, particularly favorable element types on your weapons in the early game, you can just sail past that very quickly. But this is a live environment. I don't have that luxury. Two intelligence, two agility. One dexterity, three agility. We got a J ring from that. I forget what the J is supposed to stand for. Jeweled, I think, actually. Equip the Dirk. Equip the ring. Eldelka now has lots of magic power. So Kodoka as a run is mostly a boss rush, and that is also the case mainly because there's a lot of bosses. It's one of those PS1 games where they were just throwing a new boss at you like every two seconds. PS1 games, they were like that. We open this closet and a mummy attacks. Boss fight. It's just in a cupboard. This enemy is weak to air. So we will use Tornado. Who has the air weapon again? Edward does. It's really tempting to go for an attack. But is it a good idea? Yes. I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. Yep. That's four. That might one turn in that case. Ooh, how advantageous. You too. Will it kill? Nah. Could've. I think if that didn't knock back, it might have worked. It is quite likely that that silenced Cordelka, and normally that's a huge time loss because then I have No, it didn't. Okay, never mind. If you get silenced, that's a big time loss because you would like to just have Cordelka cast a tornado and end the fight. Usually trying to beat the enemy up with your weapon takes too long. But since I have an air weapon and they're weak to air, that can work favorably. Right, I need 20 agility with Cordoka after this. And the amount of agility I have depends on the random stats of the dirt. Okay, only two. More agility, more agility. We get another ring as a drop from that fight. The exact properties of the ring are random again. Everything in this game kind of generates randomly. Like I have a water ring and an air ring that grants some elemental resistances. And if you stack those enough, there's, you could potentially start absorbing or reflecting certain elements, and that's mostly not up to you. Nor is it a necessity for the run either. We're just in it for the stats. The party starts seeing a ghost of a child wandering around at this part. I didn't get the ladder. I'm very clever. No! You have to open the wardrobe the mummy was in a second time to pick up the ladder before you leave the room. It doesn't just give it to you automatically after the fight. Run away!
Here we go. Get the ladder. Probably going to get another encounter on the way back. Maybe not quite. Something's not right. That's how the game warns you that there's a boss in the room, because they don't actually have the bosses, like, be physically in the room. We're going to walk up to this altar, step on it, and do a boss fight. Kodoka's like that. Uh, they're doppelgangers of us, the party. <laughs> Uh, we are going to manipulate the enemy's behavior by moving in a particular way. It is deterministic. We will have Cordelka cast a spell on Doppelganger James. We will have Edward move one left, one up. And pass the turn. This causes James to flee to the back. And Cordelka to move forward. Edward slaps Edward, dealing 61 damage to Edward. And Cordelka moves forward, which is good. Now I can smack her with a hammer. Bonk. Right, so how this develops depends on whether or not Uldolka gets knocked back by the physical attacks. There's a random chance that your attack can be, like, strong, but it also knocks them back, which is generally not good. You do more damage when you're up close and personal. That's going to do basically no damage. In fact, I think it bounced. I think it reflected. That's probably also going to reflect. Yep, that's reflect. When it's yellow numbers, it's reflected. Koldoka's got the funny reflection on, somehow. I think my accessory is randomly favorable. Sweet. That's good. Uh, Koldoka die. That puts me ahead of schedule in this fight. I... that is not baked into the strap, because you cannot rely on getting an accessory that does that. Very good. Very good. Oh, bye. <laughs> See you, James. James wants revenge. He runs in. And bonks him for 89 damage. What? That did nothing. And Edward bonks them for 281 damage. Much better. And the spell should kill. Yeah. Very good fight. That is luck you don't see every day. I have to prepare to do a disc swap. <laughs> I'm, I'm currently crouching on the floor. Two in, two agility, four vitality. Vitality increases health, we need it so we can survive the horrors to come. Ooh, I dropped a panacea, good for me. Uh, but I'm preparing to do a disc swap. This is a four disc game, so I'm like crouching near my console in preparation for it. <laughs> oh, my headphone wire is long enough. And this swap is... Go, go, go. Discs are swapped. I'm back on the chair. The floor crumbled beneath the party and they've fallen into a prison. Four disc? This is a four disc game, dude. I'm skipping a lot of voice acting. I'm skipping a lot of voice acting and cutscenes. They're very good cutscenes as well, actually, I should point out. Yeah, I think uh, Kudelka infamously has, like, one of the only games at the time that had actual actors and not randoms they found on the street. Yeah, they got, like, theater actors to do the stuff. And the performances are genuinely, like, very good. We'll have Edward equip the Iron Axe, because that will increase his health. Mm. 
76. But nevertheless, this is... Oh, it uh, wow, it bounced again. Huh. How much health has it got? Can I kill it by attacking? So this is an unusual circumstance. I'm not used to having reflect... Yeah, that's dead. Huh. I'm not used to having Cordelka, like, bounce all this stuff back. It's not something you can rely on having. It's working, though. It's doing good work. Intelligence to Agility, Vitality for Days, give me that sweet, sweet help on those two so they can survive stuff. Uh, we got a gun from that fight, we are not going to use it. Crossbow is the better gun. I do want this mace, however. That's an item for Cordelka, or it will let her do more magic damage. Encounter before the boss. Not ideal. We would rather just go from boss to boss at this point. Okay, we're going to get to the boss room. Is not right. Now we're going to equip Cordelka with the mace because it will boost her spell casting capabilities and form the final formation. That's the formation we're going to be using for the rest of the run. Up and at him. Okay, now we have to fight this guy. This is a pain point for the run because whether or not this enemy decides to do 6,000 damage to Edward is a bit up in the air. First things first, we're going to do a slightly different strategy than just having Cordelka blast stuff. We'll have her wait. And we'll have the other two characters use Fortify Intelligence on her to do more damage, so we are going to have her blast the enemy, but we're just going to have to buff her first. Even Edward, despite his no magic skill at all, can use any magic. Like, the, the spell list is universal to the party. And buffing spells are good no matter who does them, they have a flat effect. So even Edward can participate in magic casting. Okay, both buffs went off. That puts us in a strong position. I'm looking for around 1500 damage. Bro is casting. What is he cooking? He's cooking 300 damage, that is reasonable. I can deal with that. Good roll. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? He's casting again. That is good luck for me. We'll do Megalith again. We learned Megalith at some point, it's an Earth Element spell, it's just, it, it do the damage. This boss is weak to it, so we use it. Edward tanking like a champ. And this should kill. Very dead. Happy about that, because that boss can just do like 600 damage to Edward in one turn and it makes everything very difficult. Getting an easy ride there is good for my heart rate. Two intelligence, two vitality, four vitality, four vitality, two vitality, two int. James got two level up there, because his experience curve is such that that will always be the case when you get to this fight. Okay, we have purified this room, and now we can move on.
We have found a storage room full of treasure, so the party argues about it for a bit. I'm summarizing these, but honestly, this cutscene is very fun. Like, it's very fun to just watch these three argue. Crossbow, the much better gun. And bow arrows. I want a random encounter, but not there. Obviously, where in the monastery you are determines what random encounters you can get, and there's sometimes where you want to generate a random encounter for potential favorable drops. Uh, the, the bugs are not one of them. And they take their turn before I do. That is just annoying. You're annoying. Okay, now we are going to participate in traditional RPG randomness. I need a drop from the random encounters. I'm looking for a piece of armor for Koldelka. If we do not get one, Koldelka cannot really survive the rest of the video game. So we are relying on luck here. Uh, optional bonuses that are nice to have are nice accessories that will boost my magic damage, etc, etc. Okay. We are looking for an armor guy. Hey! Armor guy! <laughs> Going to have Edward equip the crossbow right now. Yeah, this is the armor farming segment. Uh, this can go any number of ways depending on your drop blood. This is an RPG, like through and through. Okay, that killed him one shot. I'm gonna pass my turn. You don't get drops unless you kill everything in the fight. So I do have to kill everything. You can claim experience from a fight for uh, only killing one enemy and leaving, but if you want the drops, you've got to get everything. Boom. I'll probably also get a level up off of this. No drop. Tragic. Right encounter, but no drops. Didn't even get an accessory. Grim. A sign of grim portent. Uh, there is no armor dude in this encounter, so it is not the one. However, it is worth trying to kill this guy for the potential of getting a nice accessory out of the deal. Miss. The way this is going to go is that I'm going to give this like three or four tries to get the right encounter, and if it doesn't happen, I'm going to proceed to the next boss anyway and then load a save that got the right drop. Because this really can take, like, 15 minutes if you're just simply not lucky. This is a pain point for the run. It is an RPG, like, through and through. There's heavy randomness. But I prepared for these eventualities.
absolutely nothing. <laughs> okay. Okay. I see how it is. Ideally, the very first encounter is an armor. You win, you get the drop, and you lose. My PB has that in it, actually. While I was de-rusting for the hotfix, I got a run that got perfect drop block, and I ended up PBing by about two minutes, which... Every time I'm on the hotfix or something, I PB in the game, even when it's, like, statistically not likely to happen. I did, like, it's a nice boon. I, I, I feel like I didn't deserve it. <laughs> a dub's a dub. I was, like, so not ready to get perfect luck, either. I was, like, not awake enough for it at all. But hey, technically, it was it's it's the current record for the PAL version. Because this game has a different leaderboard for every single version. PAL, American, and Japanese. Because they're all different, somehow. They've all got, like, different quirks. And yet, none of them are, like, dramatically slower than the other. The Japanese version is probably the worst for a variety of reasons, but the most prominent of which is that one of the bosses is just like twice as hard. Uh, and that sucks. But even then, it's like only a few minutes. But minutes is a lot, so PAL version it is for me. Alright, give me the drop. Give me the drop. First, I gotta do level ups. Oh? Lance. Alright. None for punchy. Moving on with my life. I will fight this guy and then load backup save. Because I do not have all day to do this. <laughs> This really can, this can happen anywhere from instantly to never. So for now, we will move on and fight this guy. So the strategy for this guy, he's weak to wind, so we'll use Tornado. James is also here. <laughs> James is just there. He's having a great time. Lance is not what we need. We need chainmail. We need a piece of armor. Such that Koldelka can survive an upcoming boss fight. Not this one, fortunately. So I'm still able to mostly keep the tempo. Koldelka was silenced. That's a grim occurrence. But I randomly dropped a panacea earlier, and I remember that this occurred. So I can solve the problem. Aren't RPGs clever? Odoka, do it again. This is probably going to kill. Except it didn't. He has a very small amount of health remaining. Sometimes that happens. Edward, shoot him! Well done. Well done, Edward. Okay, so now I'm going to soft reset the game and load my safety save because I do not have the piece of armor I need after that fight. I was not expecting to be able to get through this in a single segment. I would have been quite impressed if I did. Verify my memory card. That one. That one, mate. Give me that data. So this is a save directly after the boss I just killed, but it dropped armor instead of the sad occurrence where I got nothing. In the interest of not making everyone sit through 10 minutes of me trying to farm a piece of armor, I prepared a save in the event that I did not get it.
So the only difference is that Cordelka has some armor, and therefore she has better HP. Because armor simply increases your vitality stat by a lot, and Cordelka needs a thousand HP at least. For this fight, and the best way to go about that is to drop a piece of armor at random. So we climb these stairs, and without warning, a man starts shooting at us with a gun! Uh, this is Alias. He is immune to magic. Which stinks. Did I really not reload the crossbow on this save file? Ridiculous. Punchy, what are you doing? Anyway, we gotta kill these barricades first before we can get to Alias. This is why Cordelka needs a thousand health. If she doesn't have a thousand health, she is dead. That will kill her. Straight away. Like, no questions asked. Like, GG. And that's, a. Uh bad. Because we need Cordelka to do this to the barricades. And also, characters who die in combat get less experience, and that kind of throws your whole route off. So all in all, a pile of not good. Reload that. Delta heal herself, because this fight's gonna go long enough for that to go through another cycle. This guy attacks in a predictable pattern. He always shoots Koldelka, Edward, James, in that order, and then goes back to the start. Sadly, we cannot have Koldelka do her usual tactic of just nuking the enemy off the face of the Earth, because... the enemy is immune to magic, so we gotta have Edward use crossbow. James is also here. <laughs> James James is going to just be here for a while. He doesn't really become like a combatant for a hot minute. It takes a while for him to be built into something like usable. And we have Edward with the crossbow and not James because it confers a bonus to your tank stats and that's useful for Edward because we have him protecting the front line. If you're wondering what this turn passing stuff is, uh, running away is like faster than trying to use the wait command to pass your turn in boss fights where running doesn't work. But otherwise, turn order is a very loose thing in Cordelka, and Cordelka has like a significantly higher agility than the other characters, so she keeps rolling like extra turns <laughs> where other characters aren't getting one. Does the game ever give a reason for him being immune to magic? He doesn't believe in it. Therefore. So the basic level up strategy from this point onward is we're increasing intelligence and agility on both Koldelka and James so that they can become better spellcasters, because spell damage scales real high in this game, like, way higher than physical. Well, we pump up Edward's vitality so that he has 8 million health so that he can do all the tanking for us. Wait, really? Yeah, no, he doesn't believe in magic, therefore it can't hurt him. Kodoka is a, is a game, and Shadow Hearts especially is a series where, like, belief shapes reality. It's a thing. It's a thing in these games. Climb, Koldoka. Trying to climb ledges in this game. It, the, the tightness of the tank controls is... I mean, the tank controls are fine, but like actually interacting with the environment is like Resident Evil 2, this is not. It's very picky. Anyway, we have looped back around to the start of the game. Random encounter. 
Ooh. Hanging guy. No, he has a gun. Don't shoot Koldoka with your gun. Now, okay, we got the runaway. That enemy is a bad one to roll because there is a reasonable chance that if you fail your runaway roll, he will walk forward, shoot Koldoka in the face for like 600 damage. <laughs> and you do not want that. Here we are back in the room where the couple poisoned Edward at the start of the game. We can receive a badge. That is an equipment piece that will buff our intelligence to do more magic damage. Pick up a dragon statue. We'll head into this back room. We are collecting key items right now. This doll, that's a key item. And this mask. This item isn't necessary to finish the game, but the mask halves the encounter rate, which is very, very useful at this specific interval in the game. Because we are about to go traipsing all over the monastery, unlocking doors and what have you in a very Resident Evil type fashion. So having a halved encounter rate is very, very handy. You never heard of this game until today and you're instantly charmed? I highly recommend this game. I think Koldoka is genuinely very good. Like, if you like PlayStation 1 games, I think you owe it to yourself to play Koldoka. It's a very charming game with a genuinely very likable cast of characters that's well performed and well written. Like, it's good now. It's like not... It, on the PS1, it was so far ahead of its time that I have no idea why it wasn't more appreciated in its day. But even now, the, the performances are very lively and enjoyable. Comes recommended from me, the streamer. Okay. We have stuff. I have the doll. I'm going to engage in a little bit of backtracking. This is why halving the encounter rate is nice. Means we can backtrack without being interrupted as frequently. Go down the stairs, Cold. <laughs> Now reviewing the game like it's theatre? They acted the game like it's theatre. I think it's the most apt way to review it, frankly. Yeah. They, they recorded this game's cutscenes by putting all of the actors in the same room and having them physically act the scenes out as they recorded it. And you can tell. Because uh, there's kind of some audio bleed over in the recording. <laughs> Yeah. And for this game, they got, like, theater actors and actually acted the scenes out. That's why it's, like, very, very natural for a PS1 game's voice acting. Like, PS1 is the land of weird voice acting, but not Cordelka. Cordelka's got very good acting. Can't read for the puzzle room. I backtracked to a room. I saw the solution to a puzzle on the box. Do I dare try and get second armor drop off this encounter? Hmm. No. No, leave me alone. Yeah. Grabbed a music box. Saw the solution to a puzzle. You have to see the solution to this puzzle in this room before you can actually solve it. See, this is Kodoka like flashing back to it. Walk on the tiles in this order. And the door opens. This puts us in the library. The library is an important location because the library is home to an enemy type that we would like to get a very important drop off of. Uh, this enemy is officially called a Mars. I call it a funky dude because I didn't know what it was called at first. And it's like a little skull with a bunch of wiggly legs. And I was like, ooh, that guy looks funky. He's the funky dude now. Climb down the stairs, Cordelka. So in this room, we're going to attempt to force an encounter on purpose. Specifically in this screen, I'm also going to equip that badge I picked up. You 
can have the firing. Okay, we are looking for the Mars enemy, or the Funky Dude. Funky Dude spotted! This is the Funky Dude. We like him. He is weak to Geyser, we're going to use that. So this enemy has a chance of randomly dropping an item called a scroll. The scroll is an extremely powerful magic item. We will use that to one-shot an extremely annoying boss in disc 3. The boss, like, sucks so bad that I would really, really like to get that drop. Thank you. Funky dude, funky dude, funky dude, funky dude. Show me the drop. Show me funky dude drop. not to be. It's okay. There are more chances later. But no drop. Not today. Not this time. We made it up. It's fiction. It didn't happen. This drop was invented by a writer. Next boss. Open this door. Did I, I did equip the badger. Did that last time. Okay. Chimera. Do, 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 do. This boss is weak to Geyser, so we're going to have both Koldelka and James do the attacking. James should have enough equipment now to actually be able to do something. Maybe. That's a pretty good roll, though. This boss has about 4,000 health. <laughs> no, James is in fact not powered up. Alright, James James can be a bench warmer for this fight, too, I guess. He is not up to power. Ouch. My face. Kodoka move forward. Distance between you and the enemy affects the damage of uh, spell casting. So you don't want to get knocked back while you're doing it. You want to be close. James will eventually do damage, I promise. Just not right now, I suppose. What is this spell? What is Burl on? 600 damage. But that is okay, because Edward has like 6,000 health. You see, this is why we build for a spell cast now, because you 2,000 is... Spell damage in this game just scales incredibly. Overtly viable for the speedrun. You will get a level up off of this. Same strategy as... Okay. And the entire party has a conversation around some books because James starts, like, rifling through them and getting annoyed when he can't find something. And the party's like, what are you looking for? You're looking for something and you're not telling us what. And he's like, yeah, I'm not telling you what, though. And he continues to not tell them what. They don't trust James, and they actually continue to not trust him for the entire game. extra bow arrows here, so Edward can contribute to fights later on. We're collecting puzzle pieces to solve puzzles. Eee, extra steps. Encounters are based on the step count you take, so clean movement will get you places in this run. We 
which is unfortunate because getting Cordelka to climb up things is sometimes more of an art than a science. Okay, we access a hidden room on top of a clock with that puzzle piece. It prompts us to do another puzzle. Oh, I'm bad. Reset the puzzle. There we go. And in this room, the party encounters actually just Roger Bacon. Like, just Roger Bacon like the guy. Like he was he's a real guy in real life. Uh, he's immortal in Shadow Hearts, however. He's just a weird old guy having a great time in this. I mean, he was sleeping when we walked in. He's been sleeping for a few hundred years or something like that. And he's just like, you young whippersnappers with your magics and stuff. And he just, he just like rolls back over in his bed. Roger Bacon is just a weird old dude in this game. Quirky uncle type. Right, and before leaving the library, we will force the encounter with the menu and try for Funky Dude. Funky Dude Part 2! Electric Boogaloo! It's actually really lucky to see this guy twice. But will it be truly lucky? Look at him go. Look at him go. Look at that waddle. That's why I call him the funky dude. You understand? Give me your scroll. I am in! I dropped the scroll! I dropped the scroll! I dropped the scroll! I dropped the scroll! Ah, oh, it's a pity I had to load the save for armor. We are in. We are in. We are in. That is the luck I needed, and I have got it. I don't know what the exact chance of that drop happening is. It's not terrible, but it's not great either. But that is fantastic luck, truly. It saves me the hassle of having to do the boss that sucks scrollless. And water scroll is a good scroll to drop as well. There's a potential that you can get an air scroll, and that will not work on the boss, because that boss has an error element immunity. And that's very tragic when you get the scroll and it's the wrong element. Would Kodoka like to move? There we go. So it is looking good. Okay, so now the party is separated by a strong gargoyle enemy that kind of like blasts the other two out of the room, leaving Kodoka on her own. Uh, the trick to this fight is to leave. <laughs> you can just run away from that one. I have to prepare for a disc swap again. That's why I'm crouching. This one's placed really awkwardly as well, like as soon as you get to the screen transition. Ooh. And the screen. Ish. Okay, so now Kodoka's on her own for a bit. And this comes with its own challenges. This is one of the other reasons it's nice to have the armor, because Cordelka, on her own, with no armor, means you could just randomly game over really fast here if you get a random encounter and it hits you, like, once. Armor gives you some wiggle room to work with. Yeah, disc swap strats. I actually have the console physically on the floor nearer to me rather than in its usual place in my console rack, because otherwise doing disc swaps is, like, annoying. Oh, 
Ooh, runaway failed. Okay, there we go. Jeez. Lucky that it wasn't a different group. That one's pretty lenient with how many times you can get away with failing the runaway. This is a bit scary, because Cordelka on her own is like vulnerable to getting ganked by a random encounter if you fail your runaway roll too many times in a row. RPGs do be like that. It's not very common, but it can happen. Like, as in, I don't think I've ever actually seen it happen. I've come dangerously close before, though. We need this pendant. If you do not pick up this pendant, you cannot get the good ending. Or rather, you can't really finish the game at all. Some people call, like, the non-standard game over an ending. But for the run, it is not a valid ending type. Bloody guillotine. Only good things are happening in this room. Kodoka climbs down, finds blood everywhere, and encounters the elderly couple from the start of the game who tried to poison Edward. They're killing people in the place, and then they go kind of mad and shoot themselves. So I steal a key off them. I do not steal their gun, pointedly, for I do not need it. I'm stuck. So here's this door with a hole in it. Cordelka can't force it open, but she hears James and Edward on the other side. And is like, meet me in the library. So we do that. So now our goal is to get to the library. The pendant does not have to be equipped in order to save you from a bad, a bad end. But I am going to equip it now or it boosts my mind and luck significantly. I'm going to get a random encounter here because my movement is Shan. I lied, actually. No, I won't. I told a lie just now. Shan is Scottish slang for poor, incidentally. For the, for the like, for the probably 500 people in chat who just tilted their head and went, what? Check out this guy, by the way. I love how he smacks his knuckles. So this fight's fine if you've, like, leveled Cordelka properly. It is a bit scary because, like, she's on her own, but I don't think there's any way you can actually have this go significantly wrong. Smack them together. He reached the point. He didn't do it. I lied. Like a liar. I did not get a random encounter. Yep, three casts of Tornado does it. shotgun from that fight, which sadly we are also not going to use. One of the things that's nice about this run in terms of like the routing is that every time we get a level up, and you will pretty much always get a level up after a boss, is that your health and MP are restored to maximum straight away. Leave! Ooh, first try run. Fantastic. Love that for me. Oh, actually, the pendant is not a missable item. Like, even if you forget to pick it up, there are enemies that can randomly have mercy on you and drop it if you forgot to get it. Even in the final area, like, the, the game has, like, some conscious to prevent you from soft-locking entirely. But it's not clear that this is an option. So, and also, it's a good item, so, you know, for the run, pick it up. We are now in the graveyard. And here we run into one of the major version differences between the American version of the game and the PAL and Japanese versions. But first we're gonna have Kodoka pray at this tomb. Roger Bacon shows up behind us and is like, mm, you young people. <laughs> I'm being reductive in these encounters. He's great though. If you wanna hear Roger Bacon, just give it a try. So go behind the grave and Kodoka can pick up the entire headstone. 
this weapon is in the PAL and Japanese releases. It was cut from the American version for what is probably censorship reasons. Probably. Like, I can't confirm that, but I think they cut the wield of an entire headstone like a shillelagh from the American version for, like, religious sensitivity reasons. Which, funny. We reunite with Edward and James in the library. The cross, incidentally, is Koldelka's ultimate weapon. It buffs her magic by an extremely large amount. And a North American version of the game, you just cannot do this. You do not have access to that weapon. You have to work around it. There is an alternate mage weapon called the Cat's Eye that you can drop as a random drop from a cat enemy at around the midpoint of the run. Uh, and that is what you would do in the absence of the cross. You are not a funky dude. Fortunately, I don't need another funky dude. I already got my scroll drop. See ya. Power version, best version? Not necessarily. The fastest times are on NTSC, so I think there is like a timing. It's hard to say precisely because like the run is quite a bit different across all the versions. It's like different enough that it makes direct comparisons kind of hard. Like, is NTSC faster or are the runs just better, you know? Mm. Uh, the reason I run on the PAL version is, frankly, uh, the NTSC version is like $200. The PAL version was like 50 <laughs> so I bought PAL. But uh, I honestly think it's still an open question whether or not the PAL or NTSC version is faster. JP is out. JP's boss fights are too difficult. Anyway, we've returned back down here. These two ghosts can only be uh, placated by giving them two dolls that we picked up throughout the run. So now we can get in there. Otherwise, they will attack you, and when they attack you, they can't be hurt in any way. It's a boss fight. You just have to run away from and try again when you've got the key items. Okay, now that I'm in this room, we will equip Odelka with... cross and give James Kodelka's second-hand equipment and advance to a boss fight against furniture hmm. anyway she does just wield the entire headstone as like her combat weapon she just has she just wields the whole thing she can swing it if you tell her to It's not a particularly good melee weapon. But you can make her swing an entire headstone at an enemy. So there's specific reason my current formation, but it worked with James on Kondelka's left? Yeah. Doesn't really matter where James is standing, honestly. Oh, actually, hang on. Your bow isn't loaded, mate. Resolve that problem. The specific reason for James being on the right is just that it's slightly faster to menu, because he's already over there. It don't matter. Anyway, the furniture of that guy, the red chair was weak to water, the green bookcase is weak to earth. So we have James and Kodoka 
cast the respective weaknesses. Now James is actually starting to do some damage, now that I was able to move all of Kodoka's equipment over to him. Still not doing anywhere near as much as Kodoka, and never will, but it's, it's damage now, like 2,000 is appreciable. That is definitely a number. I think we can all agree, number. We transition immediately into the next boss fight in this room. This is Charlotte. This boss is technically optional. Uh, you cannot fight this boss if you complete a side quest, like you placate the spirit of Charlotte. Uh, but that takes too long, and we actually kind of want the experience, so we're going to kill the ghost of a child. It's okay, it's an exorcism. How can you kill that what witches are at? Woo! See you later, Cordelka. This boss is weak to Geyser, and they don't actually have that much health either. So it's not a particularly difficult extra fight to throw in. James is not going to kill off that. Uh, Edward is the guy in front tanking. He, is, he isn't offering moral support, but he is absorbing most of the damage, which is a genuinely very important role. So that's 900, that's nearly a thousand damage. That would be a lot to either of the other two. Although Koldelka is almost completely immune to magic damage at this point in the game. One of the funny quirks of Koldelka is that magic defense and magic attack are tied to the same stats. So Koldelka at this point is more or less immune to magic. The enemies will do like two damage to her. Star Brooch in that fight. Brooch? Brooch? I forget. We're going to equip it. It comes with a massive agility boost, which is very useful for Kodelka. I'm trying to remember what exactly I equip it over. Ah, the luck is useful. You take the Air J ring, and you can have the regular Fire ring. Not that it'll do you much good, Edward. But you can have it. Is 2,000 a number? Survey says no. Oh, okay. My mistake. So we equipped the Star Brooch to Cordelka. Now she has about 60 agility. Maybe about 61 or something. She needs to have 66, a very specific number, because that's what will allow us to defeat the final boss. Turn order in this game is very, uh... There's no randomness to it. Like, if you have the number, things will turn out X way. So we know exactly what our target agility is for Kordoka in specific. Next boss fight. This dude's weak to fire. So, cast fire. Uh, we would like him to use fast attacks and maybe also move forward a bit so I can do slightly more damage. This guy has about 9,000 health, which is quite a bit. What happens if you have more than 66? Then Kodoka will actually probably go too fast, which can be a problem because you want things to fire off in a specific order. Although I don't know if one point will matter that much. I haven't, like, mapped out how far you can go without it being too far. Well, you gotta know, 66 is the correct number. You don't need more than that. Casts first. We would prefer, I think, melee attacks at this point. 
they tend to resolve faster. Part of the luck of this fight is not really so much like hoping the boss doesn't damage Edward too much. He'll be fine. It's just hoping the boss does attacks with like a faster attack animation. Oh, not back. Maybe James will do slightly less damage on this attack, which may... I don't know if he would have killed with that anyway. Probably not. And... Is this enough? Yeah, there we go. According to plan. Right, what's my level up here? Uh, agility, Cordelco, then mind. Yeah. You still get vitality. You're still getting intelligence and agility, for you are still dumb as a rock. But we're starting to increase Cordelka's mind stat now. Mind is also a component of magic damage, it's not just intelligence, and there is a breakpoint where it becomes more worth it to increase your character's mind stat rather than their intelligence. This is a bit nebulous and hard to explain precisely, because mind is magic defense, but it's also like a component of attack in terms of how magic accuracy... Numbers, 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 formulas, 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 blah, blah, blah. RPG runs. Climb up to, into this room, activate a hidden switch here. This gets us into a hidden back room where Roger Bacon is doing research. He's standing around, cracking his knees. Can you get a nice knee crack? Excellent. Thank you, Roger Bacon. But because we already have the research notes, uh, we got research notes from like one of the puzzle mechanisms I inserted the disc into slightly before the previous boss fight. We can just go back in the room and immediately trigger the second cutscene. You're meant to do this first and then go down there and do that. But if you do it first, you can just trigger the cutscenes one after another and advance the game that way. Efficiency. At this point, it's revealed that the document that James has come to the monastery to look for is the Emigre document, which is apparently contains the secret to eternal life, something that Roger Bacon seems to know a lot about, being, you know, thousands of years old. Uh, James is looking for it so it can be transferred back to the Vatican. Because they like to have that kind of thing lying around. It's a sacred document. He's a holy man on a mission. Uh, Kodelka and Edward think he sucks. They think he is a hypocritically pious man who talks a big game but doesn't really follow any of it. It's great. At this point in the story, Kodelka and Edward are starting to bond over how much they hate James. That is the general progression of this party. Anyway, I picked up a bottle. I'm going to go fill it with acid. Please open the door. God. I can't describe with words why it's difficult to interact with objects in this game. You're just going to have to take my word for it. It's weirdly difficult to interact with objects. Okay, now we're going to go back 
We just needed to get some acid. The, the, the game kind of asks you to do a little bit of backtracking there. But from here on, it's pretty much all forwards. Onward. In fact, the next boss is the one we specifically dropped the scroll from the funky dude for. I had a save prepared in the event that I did not drop a scroll. But I don't need it, which makes me very happy. Go down a hidden passage in a fireplace. This is a pretty simple puzzle where you gotta set the counterweight to like a math problem you read on the table earlier. The yeah, answer's 25. Just punch that in. Solve that one real quick. Move the dolls to open the door. And ordinarily, this would be the area where you have your last chance to encounter a funky dude and drop a scroll right before Apostle. But I already dropped it, so I can just move on. I got a random encounter anyway. Woo. What if it's a funky dude? Funky dude version 2. <laughs> Look, they're blue now. Uh, this funky dude also similarly has the potential to drop a scroll. Nice to meet you, funky dude, but like... Not right now. Maybe later. See, see you next run, buddy. Something's not right. So this boss is normally an absolute nightmare. This boss has two stances. Uh, when he's wiggling around, he will absorb all incoming damage, all of it. So you just have to sit there and wait for them to come out of the stance. And it's random whether or not they go into the stance or not. So actually playing this fight normally, it becomes several minutes of just hoping that they don't do something that's very, very inconvenient and annoying. Uh, if you drop the scroll, the fight goes like this. I win. That fight seriously takes like seven minutes if you don't drop the scroll. All in mind. So many level ups holding Molly. We drop the iron crossbow from that, which we are going to slap onto Edward. And now, ooh. disc swap gaming. There are much too many wires down here. Disc four, last disc. Okay. We gotta do a little backtracking here to get back to the lab room. Our current goal as the party is to blow open that door that we just left. So we're gonna go back to the lab with that acid we collected and James will be able to concoct an explosive. This is something he just knows how to do. He is a holy man, but... I'm going to begin my work. Can you two wait for me here? He'll begin his work. Uh, at this point, Koldolka and Edward kill time by getting drunk and talking with each other. Uh, and at this point, Koldolka actually gets really angry with Edward because Edward is like, Ah, you know, it's so cool that you have psychic powers. I always wanted to go on... Uh, cool adventures, and Kodoka is, like, not really happy about the whole being able to commune with the dead thing. It's made her a social outcast pretty much from birth. Uh, so there, a tense argument is had while the both of them are drunk. And then they sober up and agree not to talk about it anymore.
It is the best cutscene in the game, in my opinion. Like, have you ever heard characters, like, convincingly, drunkenly, uh, like, angrily argue with each other in a video game? Because I really don't think I've ever seen a single other video game pull it off that well. Sadly, it's, like, four minutes long, so I can't, like, show it. The game's cutscenes are amazing. I know it might sound like I'm, like, laboring the point somewhat. But they're really, really good. And unfortunately, doing, in like, an all-cutscenes variant of this would, like, quadruple the run length. It is an RPG, after all. It is very talky. But uh, fortunately, unlike other PS1 RPGs, all of Cold Oak's cutscenes are, like, entirely skippable. So this run actually comes in at a pretty reasonable length. Secret pain people light. Climb the stairs, Cordelka. My child, you are making me sad. Cordelka. Cordelka, do it. No, Cordelka, climb the stairs. <laughs> Kodoka, no! Uh, if you would like to see all cutscenes on a hotfix, uh, write to your local hotfix showrunner today. Bug it, Dices, about it, is what I'm saying. Kodoka, seriously, climb the stairs. This is beyond a joke now. They're good lord. Yeah, it's, I, it took, I don't remember how long it took when I did it. It was like five hours, I think. Maybe four. Okay, we are now in the basement. We're going to throw Daniel's arm, we picked that up earlier, into the cauldron of life. It's going to make the entire church explode. This is a point of no return, because obviously once you've set the entire building on fire, there's nowhere else to go but up. Climb the stairs, Koldelka! The building is on fire! Breathe? Fight a boss. Boss fight time. We must fight the roots. The roots of evil. The roots of all evil. They're vulnerable to fire, so we're going to cast fire. Edward can even contribute to this fight by using his cool crossbow that he just got. Kodelka still remains our strongest damage dealer, and it's not even close. These roots will have about 5,500 health each, roughly, something like that. Yeah, Edward does 700 damage apiece with his crossbow, which is decent. Like, that's definitely damage at this point, it's appreciable. James starting to reach the four digits, though, good for him. Good for him. Well done, James. hasn't had a chance to come up in this run so far is that spells actually have a proficiency level tied to how often you use them. If you use a spell enough, it will level up to its level 2 form. The MP cost doubles and it gains additional effects. This run doesn't last long enough for spells to ever really level up, except for Flare, which is about to hit level 2. Roughly. It hits level 2 around this point in the game. There should be a pop-up for it. This like Hodelka's flare proficient something. I forget what it is. Not this cast, then I guess. But, like around about now is the time for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, this game kind of uh, borrowed the magic proficiency system from like one of the Saga games or something. But this run doesn't really have a time uh, chance for that to like develop. In normal gameplay, it matters, because it's one of the ways characters can end up differentiating themselves magic-wise, but we, we played pretty much the whole run with just level 1 magic. Wallop. Still level 1. That should be dead. Things are proceeding according to plan right now. We are killing the roots one by one. You can't escape. We keep seeing that message because trying to run is faster than like menuing to the wait button on the menu. So just smashing the button to run away lets us pass our turns quicker when we don't want to move. Yeah, I think the max level for a spell is level 3, and they become very, very strong on that one, but also very expensive. Because level 1 spells only cost 8 MP, and Kaldelka's, like, MP, it scales off your, your piety stat, which the game delightfully shortens to pi in the character stats. <laughs> Increase your pi, receive more MP. Uh, and 8 MP spells are easy to cast repeatedly during the run. You have lots of MP to work with, you never have to worry about MP conservation. Your MP pool scales way, way higher than the cost. Oh, good fight. No complaints from me. I like how he, I draw, I like how he draws a cross on his chest for like his victory animation in combat. Strength, strength. That should be mind. Okay. Now for the real boss of the game, this particular staircase. Uh, climb the stairs. Climb the stairs. Ooh, good. Uh, yay! Made it to the boss. That staircase is particularly finicky. Now we have to fight a different route. This one's got a guy attached to him. Quirk of this fight, the guy... The guy attached to that route cannot be damaged until the other route is dead. The game is not really very good at making this clear. You just get, if you try and attack the other guy, it'll just say miss. It's not a miss. Miss makes you think it's like a random thing, like there's a chance to hit and you're failing, or maybe you haven't leveled up your mind or dexterity enough to have enough accuracy. Nope, you just, you gotta kill that route first. Doesn't work otherwise. Oh, not loaded. Tragedy. Yeah, I know I've been losing the boss fight to stairs the entire run, but those stairs in particular, like, terrify me. Because if you if your movement here is unclean, you can get a random encounter, and you would really rather not at this stage of the game. This is very unnecessary time loss. Bro is casting. 1,000. That's a lot of damage. Nope. Roots move into the back. Not a fan. Still has to die. Doesn't matter that guy root is in front. That guy has to die first. Where is still not level 2 on Kodoka? That is very surprising. Okay, guy in back is dead. Now we can start doing damage to the main route. They are all weak to fire. And Guy Root has taken an unusually backwards position. Normally they're very aggressive and forward, which is kind of better because it means I can do better magic damage. But, oh, there we go. There we go. As long as they move forward for Kodoka's turn, I am okay with that. I'm less okay with that. That was a lot of damage. <laughs> Uh, maybe fence a hype? I'm gonna fence the high potion on that. I don't trust that. I'm gonna play it safe. I don't trust that. That was a lot of damage.
Because if Edward dies, obviously he's just, the guy root's just going to start ripping through the back line and, you know, then I'll die and game over and that would be bad. So we'll play it safe. Oh. Yeah, James is close enough to, wait, why is James close enough to swing at this? Should be about to die. Not quite. One more good hit will do it. This guy's about 10,000 health. Cool. They're doing the one attack instead of the free hit over and over again. I'm a bit confused as to why. Why is James within striking distance? Did I move him forward by accident or something? Oh, Kodoka's fire hit level two. It happened at some point. It's it's. Not really helpful at this point, mind you, but it happened. Okay, we win. We win. We will get the level up off of this. Please intelligence in mind. You need extra vitality. You were like dying. Climb, yes, good. Climb, Modelka. Okay, so now we step inside the church proper on the top floor. And this is where there's a plant bulb here. And the final boss bursts out of it. It turns out to be Elaine! Which is like... The ghost was calling Koldelka here in the first place, but because we have a pendant, we are safe from the energy burst that comes out of the plant bulb when she emerges. If you do not have the pendant at this point, the game is over. Uh, everyone turns to skeletons. <laughs> they die. And Lane has caught up with you! And thus begins the first of a series of final fights. Versus Elaine, the final boss. So, we gained a new spell, Reflect. It does exactly what you think it does. This is why we need 66 agility precisely, because this way, Kodelka gets to go first. And her reflect goes off before Elaine can act, protecting Kodelka from harm. Uh, James is not quite as fast. There isn't really any way to get him to be as fast in the circumstance. Doesn't, doesn't, have, enough, doesn't have enough points. So you see, Elaine does big spell. Edward tanks the hit. It bounces off Koldolka and back to Elaine for 3,000 damage. James can also take the hit. Uh, you load your bow, but otherwise you are just here to look nice. James gets his reflect out on the next turn. We'll have Koldolka attack using level 2 flare. Does a nice amount of damage. And now we want an attack to come up with exactly the right timing. So we're going to wait with every single other character. Even past Koldelka's turn once, because then Elaine will start casting. And then we have Koldelka do a flare. Elaine's attack will come out first. Now, reflected attacks cannot kill. They can reduce an enemy to zero health, but they cannot kill. This is the key point of this strategy. Edward gets owned, but it bounces off Koldelka, bounces off James. This puts a lane within kill shot range of the flare that Koldelka is currently channeling. And just like that. That's why you specifically want the agility rolls to line up that way. Enables a much faster kill.
before I move on to the next phase. Remember to heal Edward and James. And Elaine has caught up with you again. Right, second verse, same as the first, except her elemental affinities have changed. She is now immune to fire, which is unfortunate because it's your strongest element at this point. But starting off, the basic strategy is the same. Koldoka's Reflect will come out immediately and bounce Elaine's attack back to her for about 3,000 damage, which is nice. She's got about 12,000 HP. Yeah, sounds right. Uh, the main difference in this fight is that Edward can actually participate in the video game. For she is now vulnerable to being shot with the crossbow. Full 3000 damage. Get him! Well done, Edward. Now, we're not going to try to specifically time our attacks like we do in the first phase because we can only use either Geyser or Megalith to deal damage. They are immune to fire and air, and our Geyser is not as strong as our Flare, so that strat doesn't quite work on this phase. Is Elaine P with us? She's like a resurrected ghost type, you know, she's like haunting the place. That kind of deal. I sort of forget the specifics. It's been a while since I've actually watched the cutscenes of this game. I'm sorry. She's got a lot of resentment built up, you know? Okay, this will bounce her attack back at her, which means she will probably be within kill shot range of Edward's crossbow. Yeah, that looks like it. And she's gonna scuttle away to the corner. Huh, I guess Kodoka can do it too? Okay. Kinda weird. Sure, doesn't really matter. Okay, so time is coming up soon. It ends when we lose the final phase of the next battle. Shadow Hearts has this thing where, generally speaking, the normal conclusion is the canon outcome rather than the good ending. You can win this upcoming fight, but it's incredibly difficult, and the ending you get for it is non-canon, so time is called uh, when we lose this fight and proceed to the normal ending and receive credits that way. To, to really hammer home the fact that you are probably supposed to lose this fight the first time you attempt it, it is significantly more difficult than like anything else in the game. You have to really, really prepare for this to win. <laughs> Realistically, in a run setting, I think you just farm scrolls off the funky dudes for like twice as long. Ouch! Edward's dead! That did 4,000 damage! It's actually bad RNG, because you would prefer her to do the attack that hits everyone at once, and then everyone just dies. But we're just going to pass our turns over and over until Elaine defeats us in combat, and we proceed to the normal ending. What are you channeling, Elaine? What are you doing? This is the attack we want. Ouchie, ouch. Ouch. And... Time. <laughs> GG. In the normal ending, James sacrifices his life to... ...exercise Elaine's, like, spirit. I accept my fate. In this cutscene. What was my time, by the way? Then I accept my fate. 
He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone cool. is to go into I kept captivity, the pace up. Into captivity, he will go. If anyone is to My PB is a 136. So obviously, you know, nowhere close to that, but RPG runs. I, uh, I, the estimate was very generous in case of no scroll. <laughs> But uh, this one actually had pretty good luck overall. It's, I had to reload a save for the armor, unfortunately, because it was not forthcoming and I didn't want to waste, like, minutes trying to get it. But that's Cordoka. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. James and Elaine are currently ascending. This is the canon ending to this game. It's cool. Let's go home, Cordoka's a really cool game, and it's a cool run, too. For, an, for a four-disc RPG run, it's actually remarkably compact. I think this is the best, like, gameplay... Uh, the, the shortest, like... The shortest run per disc ratio I think I have in my entire run repertoire. Don't be silly. There must be something we can do. Slightly under two hours for four discs is a, is a ratio I don't think that I have beaten with anything else. Galarian's is three discs, so it doesn't quite compare. Crazy times, young people push themselves too much. In these crazy times, young people push themselves too much. That's your Roger Bacon. Ah, the sun came out. I prefer it a little hazier than. Dices, if you're talking, I cannot hear you. Okay, sorry, your Discord indicator was going off, and I was like, are you trying to tell me something? Goodbye. We'll All right, fair enough. See each other again. Hey, your nickname, Slato? What does it mean? I haven't even asked you yet. Will you tell me? It. It means treasure. Oh, that's rich. I'll remember that treasure. And Kuldelka and Edward go their separate ways after they survive the events of the monastery. Is it okay, but James does not. You not to follow him? Yeah, it's okay. I have a feeling that someday, somewhere, we'll meet again. Bilidin. The end. All right, if anyone wanted to find you or watch more Kudaka, where can they find you? If you want to find me and see more of this fantastic game, you can find me at twitch.tv slash punchy. Uh, I've kind of got back into running this lately because of this hotfix. I remember I actually quite like this game. So if you want it's to see more... game. If you want to see more, by all means, come over. I think I am due to do an all cutscenes run again at some point. I really do want to. <laughs> I like this game's cutscenes. I genuinely do. They're very the fun. Five-hour cutscene run. I will totally do it. All right. Well, thank you once again for the run of Kudelka. And as always, need to look at uh, different parts of horror, especially RPGs and just old school games. Uh, anyway, we do have a couple of more old school games for you. We're gonna, you know, diving on into retro horror tonight. So we're gonna be setting up for Resident <laughs> Evil Gaiden. Don't go anywhere. We're gonna be right. All right, everyone, welcome back from the break. Hope you enjoyed Kadaka. It is certainly a rare treat of a game to see. Uh, we talked a lot during the run itself about kind of how it fits into the old school horror vibe and how different it really was, especially in terms of voice acting. Uh, but that being said, uh, we're definitely going to be hitting a couple of different games going along with that. I guess while we're going in the retro area, we're not quite going into like what you'd probably expect, like the original Resident Evil, the original Silent Hill. But we do have a Resident Evil for you in this case, and it's probably one that you uh, don't know about or maybe aren't familiar about. Uh, that being said, this game uh, can be quite cursed, but it's also quite fun. Uh, we're going to be going into Resident Evil Gaiden with Ms. Scarlet Tanager. Take it away. What you mean by cursed, Act? This game is perfect. I don't know what you're talking about. Hello, everyone. My name is Ms. Scarlet Tanager. I am obviously going to be playing Resident Evil Gaiden, which is objectively the best Resident Evil game. I will not be taking questions at this time. So we're going to get straight into it. I will explain as much as I can as we go. But in three, two, one, go. 
All right, so this is obviously, as you can tell, a Game Boy Color game. And it's from that strange era of um, Game Boy Color game right before they went over to the Game Boy Advance. So it has those really cool looking clear cartridges. So we are playing as Barry Burton. And I believe, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this is the first actual instance of playable Barry, because I believe you can't play as him at any point in Resident Evil 1. Oh, I didn't get that one, okay. This first zombie can be a pain to uh, juke around. I will explain the battle right after this. All right, we're good. So the battle system is not your class for Resident Evil because they had to um, go through a lot in order to get the sort of Resident Evil feel on the Game Boy Color. This is our first item. And in order to do that, they sort of came up with a, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, like a pseudo RPG style combat in that uh, you have your classic, you know, weapons with ammo and everything, but you use a weird aiming reticle. And depending on the power of the weapon that you're using, it dictates how fast the little aiming reticle goes, which I think is pretty cool. It actually works fairly well. There is one specific problem, though, if you're playing this game casually, that it is extremely easy to soft lock yourself through uh, lack of ammo. Thankfully, there is one thing you will be seeing later on, which in the speedrun setting sort of makes the uh, lack of ammo problem completely mute, mute because we are going to be uh, skipping all but two of the bosses in this game. Yeah, all but two. Ish. Two and a half. All right, so we are currently looking for Leon. Let's see if I can do this here. Now this and wait. Ah, perfect. First try. Okay, that is one of the hardest dodges in the game. And if you do it perfectly, there should be a zombie in that little alcove there, but there was not because I am just too good at this game. Alright, so you come over here. Thank you. So we are looking for Leon. We don't know where he is. We lost contact with him. And so Barry was sent in to try and find him. Now for the reticle here, white does less damage, blue does the most damage. So you want to try and aim for the blue. All right, Leon, 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 where could he be? And if you're worrying about like the canonicity of this game, don't. This game is entirely non-canon <laughs> due to some uh, very specific things that happen in the ending cutscene, which if I remember, I will point out when we get to that point. Alright, let's see if I can dodge this zombie here. And, oh, don't get caught, don't get- oh, okay. So, it may have looked like I should have gotten caught there, and let's see if I can do the second dodge. I did it. Alright, it looked like I should have gotten caught there, but I didn't. Why? Sometimes, you spawn a second zombie when you raise your gun to aim at an uh, enemy. However, that spawned-in zombie isn't actually a quote-unquote real zombie. So they cannot grab you. Only the zombie that you were aggroed on can grab you. Which we're going to be using quite a few times in this run in order to uh, dodge around some specific zombies. Oh, that's bad luck. Okay, still able to get around her. Hopefully she's not there but when we reload the room. Sometimes when you down a zombie, they don't actually permanently go down. Which is bad RNG, but... What are you going to do? Marathon run. Marathon luck. All right. So we... Oh, yep, she is up. Darn it! Okay. Good thing I picked up extra healing items. So what I did right there is the runaway system. It works just like the aiming ridicule, except during the runaway, you can't attack at all. You have... Oh, and more bad luck. This is fine, though. I've had far worse luck in this game already. So this zombie has not even once. Now, if you look in the bottom right corner of the scene, in that little exclamation mark, that means that one of the zombies has an item. Most of the item pickups you're going to be getting are going to be from zombies in this game. It's where you get a lot of your ammo, a lot of your uh, extra key items, stuff like that. All right. So here we're going to be doing the first zombie related glitch in the game. So this guy here, let's call him Trevor, 
we're going to lure Trevor all the way to the other side here because we are going to turn the tyrant into him. Now we do that by triggering this cutscene. Now you can see the tyrant on the right there. If we did it correctly, I might not have done it correctly. Oh, I didn't do it correctly. Okay. So one other thing about Resident Evil Gaiden is that it has an extremely generous save system. So we went straight back to where I was. Now we're going to go back and grab Trevor again. Oh. Come on, Trevor. So you need to keep the zombie a very specific distance from you. Can't be too close, can't be too far. All right. Uh, okay, I, might, I think I got this one. There we go. So the tyrant has now become a zombie. And don't worry about that tyrant there. Don't worry about the little girl. She'll be fine with the tyrant as a babysitter. So that is the first tyrant skip. Now we're going to be going up here to grab a key item that we need from this zombie. He's being very helpful and just holding it for us. Except for the fact that he decided he wanted to be a bullet sponge today, apparently. All right, that is an example of a zombie that cannot grab you because he was summoned by the game's uh, very rude RNG summoning system. All right, we have picked up the little girl into our group, which is great. And yes, you can see she's on our party. Her name's Lucia. She's fine. Don't worry about her. It's not like she's infected with anything. I'm sure she's fine. All right, we're going to lure these zombies and get just around them. Cool. Now, the way that you game over in this game is if you get any of your active member, active party members hits, oh, hits zero HP, then you get a game over. But it's only whichever party member is active. So sometimes you can sort of game the system by switching members at the last moment so a hit hits a different party member. All right, you come over here because we need to get ourselves a lockpick for another door. Hello, zombie friend. All right. We're going to be going a little bit further. Essentially, what we're doing right now is we are at the point where we have Lucia. Cool. Uh, we still haven't found Leon. So the main reason for us being here, uh, excuse you, friend, friend, thank you, is still not found yet. So we're still looking for him. We're pretty much just running around the area, screaming Leon at the top of our lungs. Hello, friend. Oh, you turned around. That's bad, RNG. Come here. Now, at least until later in the game, it is always faster to try and dodge zombies than it is to fight them. At, at some point, we will be getting an extremely overpowered broken weapon that will sort of uh, change that a little bit. But that doesn't happen until about three quarters of the way through the game. Oh no, cutscenes. We don't want those. They're slow. All right, so we're still looking for Leon. Still don't know where he's at. Haven't heard anything. Radio silent, but we have a little child with us. For now. Now is this guy gonna cooperate? Oh, he is. Very kind of him. Oh, it's... Okay, cool. Sometimes I don't always make that dodge. It's generally pretty safe dodge, but... Okay. Now we are about to do the first actual tyrant fight. Now this one will not be skipped. It's one of uh, two, I think, two or three. No, three that are not skipped. Now you can see my reticule is going a lot faster, but that's because I'm using the assault rifle now. All right, so sadly, uh, Barry is just as bad of a babysitter as Claire, because guess who got kidnapped in that cutscene I skipped? Yeah, we don't have Lucia anymore. Oh, it's just a zombie party in this hallway. So you're going to notice some lag in specific rooms. That's consistent. 
so thankfully it doesn't really affect the run. It's just annoying. All right, guess what? We found Leon. He was in that cutscene I skipped. Don't worry about it. So Leon currently is just baggage in the team. We don't really use him until later. We're still going to be playing as Barry. So now that little Lucia has been kidnapped, we gotta go find her. So just more trekking around the ship. I didn't even mention that. We are on a cruise liner. It's very Resident Evil Revelations before Revelations. All right, so this zombie up here has a key that we need, but we wanna make sure that we get both of these zombies in the fight. Thankfully, they both go out with one hit. The reason why we wanted to get both of them in, the in one fight is... Oh, am I gonna make this dodge? Oh, I didn't make the dodge, okay. This is bad RNG. Usually the zombie that grabbed me is further down and you're able to get past here without getting in this fight. But sometimes, sometimes it'd be like that. All right. So the room that we were in earlier where you saw Barry looking at a monitor, we have to go all the way back there. Little bit of a pain. But thankfully, it's not mm, too much of a too much of a wisdom tooth to get there. Hello, friend. Come here, please. Now you see me sometimes pulling up the gun. I'm doing that in order to aggro the enemy on me, in order to make it easier to dodge them. And I think I gotta do it here. To yep, I do have to do it here. Okay, I'm gonna dodge the zombie in a specific way. Aim once there. Aim once there. And free dodge. You've got to aim before you go into the shadow to aggro him the first time in order to chug around him quicker. All right, this door that was locked earlier, we got the key for it. And now we can grab the lounge key, which is going to help us get another key. It's This game is essentially a collect-a-thon, a key collect-a-thon, just like the other Resident Evils, except there's not really any puzzles in this game. So it's like a classic Resident Evil without the puzzles. All right. Oh, hello there. Forgot about you. Please don't hit me. I like having full health. Thank you. All right. Now, as you're going on, the game decides it wants to repopulate specific areas with new layouts of zombies. Later on, we're actually going to get to a point where we're going to go through an area that we've been before, but suddenly there's no zombies in it. Now, for some reason, this game only populates the uh, intended path with zombies. So it actually lets you somewhat sequence break, not quite sequence break, but definitely go through areas the game doesn't intend you to go through. Which sadly only helps you once in the speedrun. Alright, so this zombie has a key we want. We're taking it. And we're gonna just dodge around this zombie. Hello, friend. Oh, he summoned another friend. That is very rude. We don't like it when zombies summon friends. Alright, now this is a very close to... Okay, cool. That is a very tight dodge. It is deceptively difficult to get through there without getting into a fight. Okay. Now we are going back towards the monitor room. Come here, friend. Thank you. Because we need to look at the monitors to figure out where the tyrant took Lucia. Which we have to do a couple times in the game. Did I get the rope? I did. Okay. I have had runs of this where I forgot the item there, and it uh, kind of screws me over later. Sadly, this room is now populated with zombies for the rest of the game. It's only really a pain later. Good news! We have discovered where the tyrant took Lucia. Now, the reason why the tyrant took her instead of just getting rid of her is because shock horror, she is in fact infected with a virus. I cannot actually remember what the virus in this game is called. There are so many viruses in um, in Resident Evil. It's not... Well, it's T-Virus based, just like everything else, but I can't actually remember its designation. Alright, so we have to go all the way to the bow of the ship. Which is gonna take a minute. Alright, so this zombie, we're gonna trick him. 
She gets stuck on the corner, which is great. And I'm gonna do this here. Yes, it looks dangerous, but all I'm doing is luring that one that was on the left in order to get around her. Oh no, there's a zombie behind me. Thankfully, if you just hold down, you can get through there just fine. Now, Okay, this screen here is the save point. Sadly, this game does not have a save system because uh, old Game Boy Color game. So you only have checkpoints, which is also where a little bit of the soft locking comes in. All right, so we got tyrant number two. Hello, friend. I missed. I missed again. Four, okay, that was enough. Oh, tyrant, you don't want to get caught by him because it pulls you back into the fight, and that's a waste of ammunition. And you only have so much ammunition right now. Thankfully, we picked up the key for this door earlier, so we can very easily get through here. Don't grab me. And look! Color swap! We are now playing as Leon. Barry uh, decided he wanted to go, quote-unquote, check something out and go off on his own, which... If you know Resident Evil, he's totally not going to betray us. Don't worry about it. He's not going to do what he does in every game he's in. I'm pretty sure. But no, now we are just Leon and Lucia. Now we're just going around the bowels of the ship. This is sort of... Oh, wrong button. This is sort of what I meant by doing things out of order. You're not actually meant to be up here yet. There is still zombies down here, but some of the other triggers haven't been activated. Which is helpful. Okay, there's a crowbar we needed. Sadly, this area has a lot of lag. But... and a card we need. Now that's all we need down here, we just have to go back up to the next level again. It's faster to get these now than it is to get them later. Which is why you do it now. Okay, so to go up twice. <laughs> I always get I always get myself mixed up with the specific elevator because sometimes the uh, pallets in this game can look a bit samey. How dare you slow my game down, zombie? Okay. Ooh, I got the good luck. I sometimes you can manage to get through there without aggroing that zombie. And it doesn't happen for me very often. slip on by here because Leon needs to make a phone call. And we're going to pick up key card. Hello, friend. Drag the zombie over here so we can get around him real quick. Game's giving us another save point. We don't want to save because saving is slow. Oh, that cheeky little zombie almost got me there. Rather rude of him. All right, so that crowbar we got earlier, now is when we use it. On this specific door here. Because something got set on fire while we weren't looking in the downstairs area, so we need a fire extinguisher for it. And now I have to go all the way back down to the bottom level of the ship, which is where we got the blowtorch and the computer card from earlier. One floor down. Because throughout this game, slowly but surely, the ship is sinking and exploding in random locations. So from this point on, random parts of the ship will be on fire. Equip Leon with the gun because there's going to be a zombie in here that has an item we need, and you can't pick up items from zombies until you down them. There we go. Still got some ammo left. That's good. Uh, excuse you, friend. And there's an example of a zombie that decides they just don't want to stay down. Okay. So. Remember how I mentioned we have to go all the way back to that security room with all of those monitors? 
yeah, it's time to do that. We're on the literal furthest part of the ship, and we gotta do it again. Uh, excuse me, friend. Thank you. All right, so if I remember correctly, I can go through this side door here. I always get mixed up with Leon here. I can never remember. Nope, other door. Okay. If I go through this door, if I go through the next one. Now you can't go through that door because there's fire in the way further up that hall. So you have to go through the front door again. Just like we did in the beginning of the game. Hello, zombie. Bye bye, zombie. All right, so I think it is here. Yeah, it is here. Okay, this was an example of what I talked about earlier, about all of the zombies despawning and parts of the ship that the game does not intend you to necessarily go through. This is the only part of the game where there is absolutely no zombies, and it's only for these specific screens at this specific point in the game. Sadly, zombies will populate this area later. That is a wall, Leon. All right, we're gonna take out the zombie because he is just always in my way. And also because he has a health item and safety. In a game like this, when you can soft like yourself relatively easily when you're playing casually, it, you can never not have enough healing items. <laughs> All right, so we found out where Barry is. Because now that we have Lucia and Barry run off, we have now tracked down Barry because the party is just... They just don't want to stay together. They just absolutely refuse. All right, now we know where Barry is, so now we have to backtrack all the way to where he's at. And he's not doing anything morally repugnant when he's on his own. Don't worry about it. He's doing something morally repugnant. There's still no zombies in this area, but they will very soon populate this area again. Okay, I think there's a- yeah, there's a zombie here. Hi, friend! Now I'm gonna lure the zombie over here, just so I can get around him. The second I go through this door- hello, zombie friend! Ooh, I got the glitch. <laughs> I made Leon glitch out. All right, barely had enough ammo there. So we're gonna go in here and say hi to Barry. And Barry has betrayed us. Barry has kidnapped Lucia and taken her off at gunpoint onto a submarine. Now we have to go get the absolutely broken gun of awesomeness. However, it requires you going through probably the most painful dodging room in the game. Now we're gonna use the express path that we picked up earlier. Hello, friend. Uh, friend? Okay. Well, I'm gonna focus here for a second to try and get this dodge off. Let's see how many tries it takes me. Come on. Come on. Oh, I didn't get it. Okay. That specific dodge is very, very difficult to do. So you have to go up to this corner. Come to the side here. Oh, I didn't get it again. You have maybe like a two or three pixel space to make this dodge. Oh, okay, I got it. Third time's the charm. So we need to go all the way over here, right to the bow of the ship. And by, is the bow the front or the back? I can't remember. To pick up this. This is the gas launcher. The gas launcher is absolutely broken. Because for some reason, if you run away when you're using the gas launcher, all of a sudden it gets infinite ammo, but only in the runaway state. Uh, I think bow is the front, by the way. I think stern is the back. Ah, okay, cool. You'd think I'd know that because I just spent a week and a half on a cruise ship. All right, hello, friend. Goodbye, friend. So now that we have the gas launcher, uh, no zombies can touch us, really. We only have to worry about one... Ma oh, I should have gone down one more floor. This was an example of me accidentally getting turned around on this elevator. 
I forgot I had to go down two floors. Okay, well, I'm bringing you a little further over just to be safe. Now, even though we have the gas launcher, which essentially makes the rest of the fights in the game negligible, it is still almost universally faster to dodge zombies if you can. All right, now we can go up this hall with Leon. And there's a friend up here. We want to take care of her. Put her to sleep. Give her a little bit of a sleeping gas. She's just napping. Don't worry about it. And this is just another example of the game telling you to go from one end of the ship to the other, because we have to go almost all the way to the stern in order to use that boiler key that I picked up in the same room as the gas launcher. No, this way. One downside of this game is you can really easily get turned around on the ship. Yeah, I'm going the right way. Hello, friend. Oh, I can't dodge you. Sometimes I forget which zombies I can dodge and which are just, you're not going to be able to dodge them, so you might as well take them out. This one I should be able to dodge. Usually I dodge him here. I'll bring one more up to be safe. Oh no, he summoned a friend! <laughs> Leave me alone! I hate it when they summon friends. <laughs> Hello, zombie. Are you being rude today? How dare you? Hello, other friend. Now, if you run this game yourself, it, you just have to go by feel on how to dodge the zombies. Ooh, that guy got real close. <laughs> Closer than I meant him to. All right. Do I have any healing items for Leon? You do. We'll use it there for safety. Sometimes I can get this guy dodged. Go here. I actually managed to dodge him. Cool. I only managed to dodge that guy about 50% of the time. Okay, this is going to be another tyrant skip. Coming up here in just a moment. We're going to turn another tyrant into a regular old zombie. Hopefully I get it on the first try. So we're going to take this guy, lure him over, and immediately go to this corner. Now you want to lure him when you're still on those stairs there in order to uh, make it so he hits you at the right moment. Oh, darn it. I didn't get it. Cool. I did it too quickly. That's why the timing is very important, because the tyrant has to be late in their uh, trigger animation when the zombie actually reaches you. Which is why timing is extremely important here. Okay, yeah, I got it that time. Cool. Second time's the charm. Alright, now is when you hopefully have Barry at high health, because now we're playing as Barry again. Which is why I was very glad, because this is the one of the only boss fights in the game when you can use the gas launcher glitch. Now we're playing as Barry and Lucia, because Shock Horror, even though Barry absolutely betrayed us earlier, he was actually sort of like fake betraying us in order to get uh, information on Umbrella's dastardly activities. Oh no, that's bad. That's fine. It's just one death. Okay, hopefully he behaves this time. There we go. Sometimes if you get extremely unlucky, a zombie can get a bite off right at the beginning of the um, match. That is less than ideal. Thankfully, there happens to be a full heal right there. All right, so the tyrant is just chilling on the submarine because <laughs> the tyrant is still chasing down Lucia. Now we're going to grab those gas launchers for safety later. I'm just going to walk around him because tyrants are slow. Thankfully, because if they weren't, this game would be a lot harder than it already is. All right, so we are now back off of the sub because Barry decided to leave the sub and uh, go find Leon. Because again, the party is absolutely incapable of staying together. Now this is going to be another moment where you just have to go from one end of the ship to the other. Hello, friend. Now you see me waiting to dodge the zombies until they've attacked me, 
And I do that because it puts them in a sort of cool down state where usually, if you do it correctly, they can't move for a little bit, which gives you the time to uh, dodge around them, which is pretty nice. All right, this dodge coming up here is a little bit tricky. There we go. First time, every time. I usually don't get that dodge. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> okay. Thankfully, we don't have to go all the way to the, um, to the monitor room again. I can't, I think you can go to the monitor room to find out where Leon is. But what you actually have to do is just go to where you fought the tyrant because of the cutscene that I skipped after that tyrant fight. Um, you find out Leon blew up part of the ship and it's implied that Leon might have died there. He's not dead. Maybe. Like I said, this game's not canon for a reason. Okay, that's good. Half of the time you end up spawning two or three extra zombies there, which makes you have to go into a fight two or three times in order to get rid of them all. But hopefully I can dodge this guy fairly easily. Come here, please. A little bit further for safety. And... Shoot. This guy here decided to play nice for once. That was a little bit of... It didn't look risky, but that actually was a little bit risky. About... Mm, every five or six tries or so on that specific zombie, he catches you if you don't uh, lure him, which I didn't lure him. I just went around him. All right, hello, friend. Oh, and one interesting thing about the gas launcher. Actually, I'll explain after this. Oh, Leon? Leon's, oh no, Leon's a tyrant. Oh, I didn't get the dodge, okay. So you guys get to see a legitimate tyrant fight for once. Thankfully, this should only take two hits. Maybe? Yeah! Yeah, two hits. Okay. So you can't- Oh, I got poisoned at that point. That's not good. I'm sure it'll be fine. So yeah, we found Leon. He's totally fine, you guys. Don't worry about it. He didn't get blown up or killed in the cutscene. It's it's fine. This game's totally canon. Okay. So you see the poison status in the bottom right? That is uh less than ideal. I might have to do some shenanigans. Unless I get lucky here. Or I or oh, okay, cool. I guess that was a summon zombie. He couldn't grab me. If these two zombies up here, I'm going to go in between them and then enter a fight in order to make sure that they both are in the fight. Now you see Barry is uh, rapidly losing health there. This is fine. Theoretically, we're only going to get into one more important fight. Not just for safety reasons, let's see if I can dodge her. Now you see that I'm not poisoned anymore. However, the reason I'm not poisoned anymore is because uh, Barry has no health. <laughs> so once you get down to literally one hit from dead, the poison status goes away. Only specific enemies can poison you. So we might have to make an emergency change over to Leon for the end game if I can't get through the fight easily enough. Hello, friend. Now, believe it or not, we're actually near the end of the game. And possibly the coolest glitch in this game. Hopefully I pull it off because it's also the most difficult glitch to pull off. And it comes in many, many forms. But prepare for the screen to go a little bit wonky if I pull it off correctly. That was a summon zombie. That's why he wasn't able to grab me there. All right. So hold on to your butts. Let's see if I can do this first try. Now you can see that there is a tyrant there. This is fine. So I'm going to reset the game. 
That is for a reason. I am resetting the zombie that is in the room whose door that I just opened. And the reason that I opened the door is in order to set Barry there. Now I'm gonna line up Barry in a very specific spot. Did I get the first try? Oh, I didn't, okay. So what I'm trying to do there, because there are many, many ways to pull off this glitch, and what I'm going to do is skip both of the last fights, theoretically. And actually what I'm going to do here for safety reasons, I'm actually going to equip the gas launcher on Leon. <laughs> Are you gonna, what are you doing, dude? Come on. There we go, now he's being friendly. Please summon the second one. Ah, oh, crimey. I wanna show off this glitch, so I'm well, gonna restart until I can get it. Ah, I did it, okay. So we're gonna immediately run to the left in order to get that guy to do that. I'm gonna go into the menu just so I can... Oh, okay, we're fine then. I'm gonna wait for safety reasons for that. So what I'm trying to do is get the zombie caught as you are activated on the tyrant. Oh, there we go. All right, so that is the first tyrant skipped. I'm gonna aim the gun there, that second zombie, boom! And time will be at the end of this cutscene. So I just skipped both of the hardest fights in the game right at the end. Now, the reason you're able to skip the second one is because if you do the first part of the glitch correctly, it summons a zombie in the other room, which causes you to get um, the ability to move with your character when you shouldn't be able to. And that is time. GG. So a little bit more of an explanation for that last glitch. Uh, for some reason, if there is a zombie active at that door, then um, that second tyrant fight, you for some reason get access to being able to move Barry during that scene so you can immediately run upwards, which triggers the final um, cutscene, which skips the second fight. Now, if at any point during that glitch, after I did the, um, after I ran into the first tyrant, if at any point I screwed up that glitch, it would have potentially soft locked the game. <laughs> because of how low health Barry was. Thankfully, managed it. Didn't softlock the game. All right, well, GG. Mm -hmm. uh, so, really quick, oh, go ahead. So that is Resident Evil Gaiden. Um, I wish more people could play this game, but sadly it is very expensive and hard to get a copy of it. Um, and just because I forgot to do it earlier, my rabbits, the gray one is uh, Garrus, the white one is Tally, and if you come follow me on Twitch at Miss Scarlet Tanager, they have their own dedicated webcam, and I stream mostly on weekends, but for the next couple weeks it's going to be a little sporadic because I'm moving. But... All right, thank you again very much. Uh, Gaiden is certainly a game. My favorite thing is I like to think this game is canon. You think so? Oh, I forgot to mention that. Um, right at the end there, so because time is at the thank you for playing screen, you have to get through the final cutscene, and the final cutscene is not skippable. There was one slide, you might have seen it, blink if you miss it, where it zooms in on Leon's neck and you see green blood. The implication is that Leon died when he blew up the boilers halfway through the game, and he got replaced by a tyrant, because the tyrants in this game can shapeshift into people. So yeah, this this game killed Leon, which is why it's not canon. But hold, have you ever? All right, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a moment here just to say because I always like putting uh, wild theories. I'm typing it in chat. But <laughs> all right, do you know anything about the Paul is dead theory from the Beatles? I have heard of it. Yes. So long story short, just to summarize really quick, because you have another game to get to. Mm. The Beatles had this theory that halfway through their band's lifespan, Paul McCartney died, and they replaced him with a new Paul McCartney. The thing is, though, New Paul McCartney just went on like nothing was there and made some of the Beatles' greatest songs. And the same thing happened here. Leon died, but then the tyrant was just kind of cool being Leon. So he went to do RE4. Yeah, I would say and that, but there's two very, like, he bleeds red in RE4 and he bleeds red He in drinks R6. red food coloring. He just, <laughs> he just lives off a diet of it. He turns his own blood back red, is what you're saying? Yeah, he, also, uh, people can say the Plagas made it red. He doesn't bleed until he has the Plagas, makes it red blood. That's not true. You can bleed before you get the plugs in four. 
Well, you can, but it's not a cannon. You don't take any damage. Just like oh. how no one ever gets in Resident Evil, see? <laughs> Is that how that works? I, 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 or he drinks red food coloring. By the way, it explains the, the laser room. I didn't want to geek out there, but once again, if anyone wanted to find you, uh, they could do so at the uh, Ms. Scarlet Tanager. The link was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, anything else you want to say before we go to the last game? My bunnies are adorable. Come follow me if you want to have a dedicated webcam. See them and see my chinchillas, Edward and Alphonse. They are also adorable and sometimes make appearances. All right. Well, thank you very much. We do have one more game for you tonight, so don't go anywhere. We will be right back. All right, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Hope you're all doing good. Uh, so, for our final game of the night, uh, well, originally I was planning on this being Super Ghost and Goblins, however, since that, uh, you know, we're going to reschedule that, uh, I figured I would show you uh, another retro game that is, I guess, quite fitting with the theme of kind of somewhere in the rarer retro games, but also just kind of one of my personal favorites I get to show you. Uh, anyway, I'm going to reboot my console here, but this is the original Clock Tower, and we're going to be doing... Uh, a category called A Ending. Uh, this game has a lot of different endings. Uh, a Ending has kind of become a fun category that I have grown to enjoy because this has some unique tech. Uh, however, as a speedrun, there is a bit of RNG in it, so depending on that, might change the route we take. Uh, hopefully it'll be good, but I'll try my best to break down this game. Uh, as well, uh, this game does hold a special place in my heart as a runner, because uh, not only, uh, you know, is it one of my personal favorites, it's also the very first game I got into speedrunning with. So if you're wondering, how did I get into all the speedruns and the crypt stuff? How did I get into speedrunning? It's because of this game, um, which it's always nice, huh? Uh, anyway, uh, that being said, we can start in three, two, one, go. So Clock Tower is a game that kind of came back, uh, came out back in the 90s, and it was exclusive to uh, Japan. So the only way to play this game would be to, I guess, live in Japan, because it only came out on the Super Famicom. Uh, that being said, um, this is one of the original horror games and actually predates Resident Evil. It came out in 1995. And it's also aged pretty well, and we're getting a new port of the game coming out in 2024, uh, which is going to be the first American, uh, I guess, or even just global release in general. Uh, now, that's bad RNG. Uh, normally, if you were not doing a marathon, you would actually reset it right there, but that is, uh, that is rough. So, if you're wondering, how do I know what's going on? I just memorize what sentences are good and bad. So, if you see a sentence that has dots in it, or, you know, the ellipses, that's bad. If you see a whole sentence, that's good. Why? Because this game has a lot of RNG in it. Uh, that is the West Wing key, which kind of decides how you get into the back half of the game. Uh, anyway, really quick, we're going to be getting our first major skip of the game. This is called the Bobby skip, because if you skip Bobby, it's simple enough. He's going to drop the ceiling killing Anne. Now, the thing is, if you run into him, you will die immediately. However, in this game... Reactions do not take priority over actions. So I command, oh wait, uh, I have to go. Uh, you command Jennifer to go to the stairs and then that will take precedent over the actual, you know, death animation. You're not gonna die because Jennifer wants to go to the stairs. She's never gonna react to Bobby because it's already put in the command. This only works in the original version of the game. If I had the West Wing key, we would actually keep moving and go to the door on the bottom side, but I didn't get the key and we need to get the key. So we're gonna have to go there. Also, I said it is one of the original words games. The original horror game is not Sweet Home, it's something called like 3D Monster Maze that came out on the Atari. Sweet Home is one of the more notable ones that led to Resident Evil. That's what I'm saying, Clock Tower predates Resident Evil, because it's one of the older ones. Even then alone, the dark predates that. And if you want to know the first horror game, it's either, I think it's like Haunted House or 3D Monster Maze. Sorry. Uh, anyway, I talked a little bit about ports of this game. Uh, we can get into that in a moment because really for speedrunning, the only good one to run is this one. Uh, but we're going to hide from Bobby. Uh, we're going to get a little panic event. Uh, that is the flashing light. You just have to mash the panic button and then that will allow you to hide. Uh, you can fail that. That's actually what the color on the bottom left means. Uh, if you're in red, that means it's harder to pass QTEs. That's all it means. Uh, if it's blue, that means you're fine. Uh, a lot of people think this is a stamina system. There's no movement speed differences. Uh, you always run about the same speed. Uh, anyway, we actually do need to get rid of Bobby. Uh, there is a few ways of doing this. However, uh, we use this area because for the bad RNG that we got with the West Wing key, this is right next to where we need to be. Uh, as well, we are going to need this item for later, so it's going to be good to have for now. 
All right. Anyway, the West Wing key is an RNG uh, item that's either in the box I went to or in this crow's nest. Uh, I'm going to play it nice and safe because usually I go like, oh, there's a crow's nest. So we're just going to like, oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, and then we're going to go talk to this box. This will slow us down just a little bit because, again, normally uh, you just kind of reset it until you got what you needed. But for A ending, this is actually why I like this category. You can just sort of not worry about RNG. And no, it is not. All right, so now that we got the key, it's an invisible item, so you're not going to see that I have a key. But we're actually going to be able to see something quite neat, which is the idea of the game's glitches. So once you get an item in Clock Tower, the game gets busted. You can see Jennifer just vanished. So I'm beginning the first major glitch right now, which is going to be uh, lag reduction. So whenever you mash an item button, um, you are able to have Jennifer remove certain lag frames in the game. Every single screen in the game has areas where if you push the button, it can remove the lag. So I'm mashing the button just kind of rhythmically. And you'll be able to see Jennifer running faster than she should be able to at this point. Uh, the game doesn't expect you to remove this lag, so it doesn't account for it. Like normally you'll see she keeps up there, but you push the button. Oh no, Jennifer's gone. What happened to her? So this is going to save room in every single hallway in the game. And it's going to begin our area of glitches. Uh, now we have a problem, and that is the game's RNG. So, we're now in the West Wing, and the room's randomized. I actually got uh, really good RNG here. Uh, oh, hey! Really good RNG! Okay, I also get to tell you about the next skip there. So what I did there is called text skipping. Uh, this is the next major thing. Clock Tower is a point-and-click game. However, uh, we don't want to read. Reading is boring. Ever play a point-and-click game, and then you just watch the runners mash their dialogue? Yeah, we don't have to do that. If you open up an item at the same time as doing an action, so it's going to be Y and A together. Watch, see if I can land it. Uh, you open this up, and you can overwrite the text by swapping back and forth because the text box is shared between item and text. So what happens is the game thinks like, oh, you need to finish all the dialogue, and then you can move. Um, but if you overwrite the dialogue and go back, it's gone. It's done. So you can just straight up skip that. Anyway, this is an RNG fight. You're going to run past. You're going to just move. It doesn't work. You, you lose time. Uh, we just have the way out now. Also, Bobby Bardos is the name. Bobby Bardos. B-A-R-R-O-W-S. Uh, is the main, uh, villain. Who's not really the main villain, but more of, like, a subordinate of the main villain. Uh, but yes, the main villain, uh, that chases you, the Scissor Man, is known as Bobby. The Scissor Man name does not come till later. Uh, there's also the other Barrows family members. This is also based on a movie called Phenomena. So if you want to watch it, Dario Argento. Anyway, really quick, just to kind of add on to this. I got really good RNG, meaning I get to show you a really cool skip. If I got bad RNG, you wouldn't get to see the skip. It is a unique to good RNG. So, the game has two types of RNG, which is either the demon idol or the staff. Before I get into that, let me show you another skip here. So, if you start running past this hole, you can't do it. However, you can use the text box right here to float above the ground. Uh, this is a power uh, that is held by Jennifer. Uh, let's see if I can get this, by the way. Dang, get it. Uh, you can skip this. It is task perfect. We've never found a way of doing this. Um, it's doable. I've never done it. Uh, only task has done it. So, if anyone can do that, you can save a lot of time in a world record. Uh, anyway, now that I got the item, we're going to do the reverse of this. I'm going to use the item text now, and we can run back across. Uh, it is the power where she is able to uh, float entirely. Which is nice. Uh, anyway, if you're wondering, for RNG, why is this one faster? So, between the Demon Idol and the Staff, there's kind of a weird hitch. Uh, also, hold on. Do I need to free the crow? I'm going to free the crow just in case. I'm trying to remember. I don't have my notes. I... Do need... I think I do need to free the crow. Why well, do I remember right now? Oh, God, I'm panicking. Okay, let's see here. One moment. If the worst case scenario, it's one room. Let's see. All right, here we go. So, text skip once again. And then you can see the item immediately get in our inventory. There we go. And either way, this will feed into the estimate pretty well because we got the good RNG. There's going to be one more bit that we're going to require. However, that should be fine. Uh, at the very least, we should be okay, though. And we're going to free the crow because even even if it's not necessary for a ending, uh, it's a good thing to do. We're saving the animals. That's how it goes, right? So we're going to save the crow right there. Okay, so I was talking about the demon idol and the staff. So Jennifer has innate knowledge of the demon idol because 
horror girls always have knowledge of demon owls, I guess. It's a, it's a special power. However, the staff, on the other hand, requires you to learn about it. It's a random staff in the mansion. So Jennifer doesn't have innate knowledge of that. So if you get the staff, you'd have to go to like three other rooms and take a while, go up and down stairs slowly. But with the demon idol, you can just use it the moment you get it. So what's going to happen is now I have all the tools I need to go into the end game. Uh, if you ever played Clock Tower, uh, this game has a point of no return, which normally it requires you to find a cloak and a perfume. Uh, that will then allow you to pass a one shot kill dog. Uh, the dog is kind of the, oh, you don't have the puzzle done. Go do the puzzle, the item check or else you can't pass it. And then the thing is, once you pass it, you can't get back to this area. You are locked out of the area. Uh, my favorite ending is actually A ending. I think A ending is the most interesting. And then worst ending is just, I guess, you know, the car ending. Or I guess so D ending, I guess, or something. One of like the endings that doesn't have a lot of nuance to it. And right now we're in the final lair. However, we have not done everything, and this is kind of why I like A ending. Uh, a ending has a unique glitch, which is going to be called, uh, well, first off, let's talk about glitch A. So glitch A here is called dog skip. Uh, you can't pass this dog. However, I can do this, uh, where I can use this text box and I pass the death hit. That would kill you. Uh, you, like, you might know this. If you run in that dog, it is a one-shot death. It will immediately kill you. Uh, anyway, anyway, I, uh, skipped all the dialogue for the dead friend because Jennifer's not a very good friend. She's not gonna comfort her dying friend. She's gonna stare and then leave immediately. Uh, but now I just need the camera to fix itself. Okay, so... This is reverse dog skip. Uh, as you can tell right here, if you ever try going back, it says, oh, the perfume wore off, I can't go back. Uh, we can actually use the text box to go back. Uh, oh, I uh, missed it, that's fine, that was not a death miss. Uh, there's two types of misses here. There is a, uh, a stopping miss and a death miss. Uh, so let's see here. So, it might take me a little bit. It's not the easiest skip to get. Usually I kind of rhythmically mash it. Maybe a little bit later. Luckily I'm dying in point A and not point B, but this is not looking well for point B. Let's see. Almost. Come on. So this one's much harder than dog skip. Got it. Okay. So, you notice that the dot 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 there showed up twice. Also, I just went back. Uh, point of no return? No, no, we, we just go back. It's fine. Normally, if you run into the dog in part one, you die. In part two, the game will force you to go, oh, the perfume is gone. So when I skip the dog originally, I, I skip both of those so I can keep running. The thing is, though, doing that in reverse, one, it will stop you, and two, it will kill you. And it's a little bit more awkward because you don't have the exact timing. Uh, but with that, I'm, what I'm able to do is I'm able to talk to our dead friend Lot. Because Lot, in a few other things in this game, have some parameters. To get the different endings in Clock Tower, they require you to talk to different people or see different events. So in order to get A ending, you need to know the truth about both the main villain, Mary, and you need to know about Bobby and how to beat Bobby. So Lot will actually teach you how to beat Bobby. However, the thing is, if Lot dies any earlier, Lot can't teach, well, she can't teach you about Bobby, she's dead. And you need to go read a book. Reading books is slow, so we don't want to do that. So talking to Lot ends up being faster, even on A ending with Lot, you know, like you wouldn't normally be able to do it because Lot would be dead at that point. But since we get talked a lot down there, she teaches us about Bobby. So we have one half of a requirement done. Uh, now we do have a little bit more RNG, uh, which is for A ending, and this is going to be unique. You need to get thrown in the shed. Um, there's normally two ways of finding out the truth about Mary, which is either one, you go to the shed, or two, you talk to your dad. Uh, I mean, I guess it's more of a note with your dad. Uh, anyway, I'm going to grab the ham right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk to these, uh, the liquor cabinet. Uh, I guess it's more like a spice rack or something or something. I anyway, know you need to talk to it twice. Uh, this is where RNG is going to come in handy. Um, what I need is I'm going to need Jennifer to freeze and not walk back. All right, we got bad RNG. That's fine. Uh, not the end of the world. I luckily uh, have a... Wait, did I talk to it? I think I did. Oh, let's see. I think... I'm pretty sure she did talk to it. Okay, okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. Just making sure we have the bad RNG. Uh, normally what happens there if you get good RNG is your portrait will change to blue, and it didn't, so I was like, oh wait, why didn't it change? Uh, anyway, if you don't get the good RNG there, you'd use the insecticide. But, in terms of good RNG, what that would do is that would poison you, which would then get you thrown in the shed immediately. I know, I know, it's funny. Oh wait, isn't poison bad? Yes, however, we want to go into the shed. So, in this case, 
the only other way to get there would be getting the key. And then you watch a little bit of a cutscene. Um, if you're going for record, this would be unideal, but luckily for a marathon setting, like, the fact that we got the Demon Idol is pretty much going to put us under estimate. Uh, the estimate I have in general is much higher than I would normally want to make it, and this is because, well, if you get the staff, it gets much, much longer. Hey, okay, good RNT there. All right, so this is the cutscene I was talking about. Here's Mary, and you're going to learn to distrust Mary because she's going to get alcohol out of the liquor cabinet, and she's going to get it with Jennifer. And then she's going to pass out immediately because she's a lightweight. That's how it goes. Then we'll get thrown into the shed. Now, as well, you may have noticed I grabbed the ham. If you don't have the ham, you die immediately. It's an instant death. Uh, it's kind of one of those old-school uh, horror point-and-click things where, oh, you didn't do blank? Dead. Yeah, Clock Tower's a pretty neat run. Uh, I really like this run because for point and clicks, there's a surprising amount of in-depth stuff. Uh, I run a decent amount of point and clicks, and none of them have nearly the amount of skips that Clock Tower does. A lot of them kind of play the genre pretty straight. But uh, I think Clock Tower being on the Super Famicom really helps, uh, especially just having the controller here. Uh, anyway, uh, remember Lot? Uh, she was the girl in the red shirt. She died earlier. We found her on the ground. She was dead. May Lot rest in peace. Uh, can we all have a nice uh, round of Fs for Lot? Uh, doesn't that lock you out seeing your dad? It does, but this category, we don't want to see the dad. Uh, this category, we're going to be using the other method of the truth, which is talking to Mr. Barros, who's locked in the, the cage. Uh, anyway, we're just going to sit here uh, messing with our items, and, you know, we're going to wait in jail. Uh, this is how speedrunning works. Wait a minute, is that Lot? Oh my god, Lot, she's back alive! Oh my god, she came back from the dead! Wow, what a true friend. She risked, she literally came back from the grave. To save us from jail. Lot really is the best of us. I'm sure nothing bad will happen to her. Oh no! Lot's dead again! Alright, well, uh, rip. Alright, so we're gonna use the, the wood here. We're gonna knock out Mary. And now we know the truth about Mary. <laughs> we're just gonna bonk her in the head. We're not gonna take the gun, though. We don't, we don't need the gun, but now we've done it. <laughs> anyway, that's sort of like running A-ending. You, <laughs> you're gonna bring Lot back from the dead just to have her killed again five seconds later. Uh, anyway, I'm going to do a minor skip here. I'm going to use the text to avoid the box. I'm just going to run straight through it. And now we're going to go back to the end game. So, uh, I have the truth about Mary. I have the truth from a lot from earlier. That's what reverse dog skip was for. And, uh, now we can just go straight to the end of the game. Uh, which, funny enough, we are going to have to do dog skip again. However, dog skip on the forward end is a lot easier. Funny enough, uh, as I've ran the game throughout the years, I remember when I started doing a lot of, like, you know, speedrunning and, like, uh, different showcases of Clock Tower, dog skip was always, like, one of the hardest skips in the game for me. But I guess I've been running this game long enough where it's not really too much of an issue for me anymore. It's quite, um, I don't know, it's kind of like some muscle memory sort of deal, right? I remember it quite well, and it's it's nice. All right. Also, in case you're wondering about the robe and perfume skip here with the dog skip, uh, normally you would have to get the robe from the first room we were in with the, um... Also, here's dog skip. We're gonna go right there, push that, push it again. And now we can officially go to the end game here. Yeah, you'd get the perfume from the room with the parrot in it, which is right in the beginning of the game. And then you would get the robe in the attic. Uh, anyway, right now this is pretty simple. We're just gonna do a bunch of, um, lag reduction here. And they're nice and easy. And now we get the big plot twist of the game. They talk about this thing called the Cradle Under the Stars. So here is it, the Cradle Under the Stars. It's a giant baby. By the way, fun fact, I was talking about a theory earlier about Leon. Uh, I actually have a fun theory about this, and it involves different versions of Clock Tower. So this is Bobby Barros's, the Scissor Man's twin brother, Dan Barros. Uh, they're wondering, by the way, yes, they're, they're identical twins. If you're wondering why is one of them a small child and the other one a giant baby, that's not actually a giant baby. That's a young boy piloting a giant baby mech. Because you have to understand, the plot of this game is like, you know, dark magic and uh, cannibalism. 
So that's a baby entirely made out of orphan meat. So the plot of this game is that Mary's been adopting orphans and butchering them to feed her child. So he just eats so much orphan meat, he made a mech out of it. It's kind of like Evangelion, but, you know, a lot more orphan meat. And also, it's flammable, because you pour kerosene all over it, so it's gonna burn the shell. In case you're wondering, I'm actually kind of serious about this. Um, in other versions of the game, um, Dan walks out of the body when it, uh, gets set on fire. And it, like, he's exactly like Bobby. He looks exactly like Bobby. He's actually in a shell. That is a genuine shell. And calling it a mech is obviously a bit crude, but it's kind of accurate. He's piloting. Like, he's actually piloting a mech. Uh, anyway, time is coming up, and we'll be watching our ending. Uh, ending A does end on last action, which is the elevator here. Um, however, we will watch the ending. I do have another treat for you afterward, because this game is decently short. But, uh, time will end once I hit button 3, which is going to be in a moment. Uh, hopefully the elevator's gonna be all good. Uh, since we got that, we should be nice. And... Time. So we're gonna watch it to make sure we actually got the ending we need here. Um, if we get the proper ending, we're gonna see our friend. Um, a ending requires you to do a few things. One, it requires you to, uh, make sure only one friend dies. Now, Lottie does- Lot, Lottie, she does not count as a friend. I mean, she is a friend, but she doesn't count. Uh, only Anne and Laura count. Anne dies in the very beginning because Anne dying is faster, uh, so we don't kill Laura. Uh, Laura- Laura is slower to kill, so she gets to live. Uh, going along with that as well, uh, you do need to know the truth about Mary and Bobby, which is why we're up here. And I do believe we needed to save the crows, so all that needed to be done. Uh, if we do it right, we should get a nice reunion. So let's save. Well, they're not piloting the attack on Titan Titans, are they? Uh, maybe, I don't actually know. Anyway, if you're wondering why Bobby kind of freaks out, um, the best way I can describe it is the clock tower's in a time stasis. Bobby was born with, like, seven tumors, and by activating the clock tower, you've activated his seven tumors. So just imagine getting, like, a bra like seven just brain aneurysms at once, and then Bobby dies. Anyway, it does look like we're in Anning. There's Laura. We did it! What a happy ending. I'm sure nothing bad will happen. Steve, we get a friendly reunion at the top of the clock tower. Yeet! Oh no, she died. Anyway, so we did need the crows. I'm glad I remember the crows. It's like, I need the crows, right? Yeah, we need the crows. So after the ending, I do have one more thing to show you with Clock Tower. Uh, we're just gonna finish it up here and make sure we uh, we got it. But that is ending A. Um, that's kind of why I like ending A though. I think Reverse Dog Skip is such a cool trick that I've really warmed up with the category. Like, S ending was my main category back in the day, but just ending A, having Reverse Dog Skip is such a cool thing, just watching, um, Lottie die twice. And then the crows save us, and we are able to win there. And now Jennifer gets to chill at the top of the clock tower. So, I'm gonna do this as a slight precursor while we're watching the ending here. Well, for one, um... If you want to check me out more Clock Tower or any horror games or just learn more about the Crypt, I am McDysis. Uh, Twitch ID slash You can find me there. However, before we actually do end, I do have one more thing I want to show you, and this kind of goes into something that a lot of people wonder. But I bet you're wondering, how can I get into speedrunning? What can I do? I'm going to show you two categories. Um, speedrunning is often easier than you think, and just being able to have an understanding of what to do, I think, can help. Um, so I'm going to have a, a meme one and an actual one. Um, yeah, the ending, we're at the top of the clock tower, we get the credits. However, uh, we're gonna have something fun here. So, um, we'll change the title here, but we're gonna actually start on something really easy called H ending. Um, I'm just gonna, this is gonna be a joke one. It's gonna take about two minutes. We'll add it in. So, for those of you who don't know, clock tower has an ending list. Um, whenever you open the game, there is a whole list of endings here, right? S, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Uh, this is a super easy speedrunning category. Anyone can get into it. Uh, this is H ending. There's a, a lot of resources here, and this kind of shows you not all speedrunning has to be hard. Sometimes it's pretty simple. Uh, anyway, for H ending, let me just show you really quick how this is going to go. Uh, I'll say about two minutes. I'll put like 2.30 or like three minutes is an estimate if you really want this. Anyway, this is going to be a full-blown tutorial. Like, you can follow along at home. Okay, ready? I'll even show you the controller the whole time. All right, three, two, one, uh, go. Anyway, you're going to... Go left, all right? Just, just mash the left run button. You're gonna, you're gonna go left, okay? 
You're gonna keep going left. So H ending's an ending where you immediately leave and you just go in the car. So, uh, my left button's not the best here, so I might be losing a bit of time. I actually was mentioning earlier I need to get it repaired. My button's been sticking. But uh, this room, you're going to go left, okay? Uh, you're going to stop here. There's a trick you can do. However, it's not needed for world record. Go left. Just, just go left. Here's the only trick. So this is Bobby Skip again. You're going to hold down left. You're going to go a little bit up. You're going to push this button, and then this button, and then this button, okay? And it looks something like that, that, that. Got it? Check it out. So when you spawn in... You're going to push this one. You're going to wait to pass Bobby. And then you're going to run again. You, you just keep going left. Now, the next room is going to be very difficult. Try to keep up. You are going to go left again. Just keep going left. Okay, en enough silliness. Now we're getting to the one room that actually has tech here. So, if you want to roll the record, what you're going to do here is you're going to go left. Except this time, you're going to get the car into view. And then you're going to go back and you're going to pause right about here. Uh, this is RNG like hell. If you want brutal RNG, you can climb the ladder and wait. However, you need to listen. Best RNG wants Bobby to enter the room and immediately leave. It is rare, but it can happen. Late entry. Early leave. Okay, so he left the room immediately. I got the early I got the early leave. I didn't get the early entry. Anyway, you're gonna grab a key right here, right? So I'm gonna say it's a little bit slow. Uh the way tech skip works is you get your item, you get your item with these in the menu, right? This button will do item menu. You're going to push this button and this button at the same time. Respectively, they're Y and A. So it's gonna look something like this. Let's see if I get it. Oh, oh. There we go. You're gonna enter the car, and now you're just gonna wiggle it back and forth. You're gonna do it again. And once you get to the third one, time. H ending is a super easy category to do. And uh, then, then that's, uh, you beat Clock Tower. That's H-Ending. Which is the, the game's car ending. Like, oh, you leave immediately. You just ignore everything. Okay, so I wanted to show that off because it's short, but here's the actual thing I wanted to show off as more of a general tutorial. So, I mean, you're wondering, hey, if that's short in the other one, what's like the shortest category, right? Funny enough, that's not the shortest category. As weird as this sounds, it's not the shortest one. Uh, for us to here, let's throw about like 20 minutes on. But uh, with all the endings here, the shortest one is actually the D ending. So just to break it down really quick before we begin. S ending is the best ending. A ending is the best canon ending. Uh, B and C are both canon endings to a degree and are still good. Uh, D, E, and F are bad endings. Uh, D requires you to go to the second floor without knowing the truth about Mary, which then she'll stab you. Uh, e ending requires you not to know the truth about uh, Mary, and then you go to the third floor. And then F ending requires you not to know the truth about Bobby, which then he will just kill you before you go in the elevator. Uh, in terms of other ones, G ending is going into the car with two friends dead. H ending is going into the car with one friend dead. Now, the thing is, there's no way to actually get through the game without killing zero friends. Without speedrunning. So, what's going to happen here is we're going to find a way to get to the car without killing a single friend. Meaning, we're going to skip and dying, and we're never going to meet Lord. We're not even going to meet, like, we're, we're going to not even meet Bobby. We're going to avoid meeting Bobby entirely. Whenever you meet Bobby, he kills your friends. So, we don't want to kill friends. That's bad. However, the thing is, when that happens, you can see an ending list here. I'm going to get a category called the glitched D ending. We're going to do a couple of glitches, and that's going to allow us to get the D ending, because if you do what I'm about to do, it just gives you the D ending. Uh, if you try beating the whole game doing the same thing, it'll give you the F ending, but this will give you D ending. Anyway, uh, let's go over this now. I will say right now, uh, this category does take about two minutes, so this will be more of a general showcase explaining why everything works. And then, in theory, if you want to try this at home, you should be able to. Anyway, three, two, one, go. Okay, so Clock Tower is pretty easy first off. We're going to go the same way. We're going to go left. Except, all right, this time we're going to be entering this room. 
right here. Um, this is a path not a lot of people know about, but this room actually has an entrance here, right? Uh, there is a hole in the wall right here, which you can go up here and use a rock, and then you'll be able to break it. Uh, you also get the rock during the whole game. So you can actually keep it and keep it as an item. So that's going to help for any item glitches that I talked about during the A ending run. So this is the courtyard. And just to show you what's going to happen, if you try running through the courtyard, this will happen. When you pass this tree, a scream will always happen. Uh, this is the Anne death. Uh, which Anne drowns for a very long time, she'll die, and then Bobby will spawn. Which is kind of funny, because like you're not actually able to escape here, like, you'll always eat a hit, and in theory you'll die if you, like, have low enough stamina. So, it's kind of weird that they even have this as a thing, because you can't escape Bobby. But either way, if you go in the courtyard, Anne will spawn. And the thing is, a friend has died. That's bad. So, what we're gonna be doing is something a little quirky. Uh, we're gonna go continue. Uh, luckily, this game has a generous continue function. So. The game has some interesting properties with the way movement works and with the way game triggers work. So, like I said, this tree right here. Right about where this line is. Uh, if you pass this line with Jennifer, like right now, a scream will happen. If that scream happens, a friend has died. So we need a way to bypass that scream. I just want to show the exact line, the exact tree where it's at. So Jennifer's kind of weird as she moves, like I mentioned. Uh, the reason why is because you don't have to use the cursor move like you can. However, I don't recommend it. I've never used the cursor move. You can use left and right. However, if you do left and right, she does these big old turns, these giant sweeps. So, like, let's see, if you're trying to turn right, uh, she'll put her, like, wait, which foot is that? She'll put her, I think her left foot out, and if she does left, she'll put her right foot out. Let's see these giant turns, right? So the thing is, her position is not based on her feet. They're, they're based on, like, the center of her shadow, if that makes sense. Uh, so when you're doing these giant turns, you're actually getting a little bit of forward momentum that Jennifer shouldn't be having. Now, the thing is, when you're moving, the game is surprisingly intricate. Uh, you can see big turns, but if you do this, you can actually force the game to not have Jennifer complete a turn. So you don't have to, like, you know, get your recovery. You can just end up a little bit forward, like so. So what I'm going to do, let's see if I get it, I'm going to try doing this turn right about... Here, up, oh, missed it. It might take a few tries. Come on, I usually, uh, usually have a bit more practice, but uh, this is a bit of a last minute fill. But you, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. A little bit of wave dashing. This always takes me a couple. I never get first try. It's always like a couple of tries here. It also works a little bit better when you can actually, uh, you know, be in the, be in the movement. Do you hear anything, anyone? Does anyone hear anything? Did you hear a scream? So, as you noticed, there's no scream. I have managed to start a step past the event trigger by doing the wide turn and canceling it. And now there's a box here. <clears throat> now I bet you're wondering, oh, that was a fluke. Oh, uh, you didn't do anything. All right, watch. Funny enough, with this game, the trigger never leaves. So if I go back to this tree and go back, it's still there. So what I've done with that is I've managed to move Jennifer past the death point, and as a result, you're actually going to be able to skip the death entirely. So at this point in the game, what's going to happen is you can get through the whole game without killing a friend. So Laura never dies, Anne never dies, and you can make it so Lottie never dies. So let's do that again. And uh, we're going to keep moving now. We're going to go to the end of the game, or back to the car. So uh, you can actually have, you have the item, by the way. Remember the item? So uh, continuing on glitch-wise, uh, this box is in the way. You can move the box. However, that's slow. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the item glitch once again. For anyone who may have missed it, the item glitch works by... You spawn a text box at the same time as running. And that kind of moves you through things you're not supposed to move through. So you can't really move. However, if you do that, you see she nudges forward a bit more, and then you can run through it. So at this point, I am now in the West Wing hallway. Uh, we're now going to be going into the main foyer, but since we're entering from the top of the foyer, 
the game doesn't think that we should be killing Anne. Normally, if you enter this, uh, you know, the foyer here, uh, you'd get the, the really cool Susperia death. But as you can see, there's no glass. The, the door is here. But if you go through this door again, you would actually cause the death to happen. But the death never actually happens. So we can just go, you know, beyond to the rest of the game here. Which, by the way, if you get the West Wing key, you can do the whole game up until the elevator, like, all the way at the end. It just, the game won't let you proceed funny enough. Like, it will stop you before you try going up, even if you do everything. The game requires at least one death to get beyond a bad ending. So, the only endings you can get here are D ending and F ending. Anyway, I'm going to put my cursor right about here, and we're going to do a tech skip since I have an item. Uh, that's going to give me the key instantly, and then we can just go right in the car. And as a result, this is the same thing as H ending I did just before. Uh, you're going to be doing the glitch uh, twice, and then using the key three times. I, I thought I messed up the second one. That is fine. Bobby is not active, actually. The only way Bobby can get active right now is through a very rare glitch. Anyway, that would be time for that, but we're not totally done yet, uh, just for a regular D ending. Um, what we're going to do now is why the estimate's higher is because we're going to be also showing it all in motion. It's one thing to see what's going on, but also just being able to know, like, how does it all look pieced together? That's the important part. Because that's the that's just kind of the concept. Also, the game doesn't give you the car, it just throws you in the credits. Uh, if you manage to do that, that would give you the D ending in the ending list, which is why it's called the ending, glitch D ending, because it is an official way to get that D ending. Um, as a result of all this, you actually end up getting something faster than H ending. Also, this is one of the only categories with no RNG. So now uh, we're going to break it down nice and easy, going through the whole thing step by step. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do one more of these, but with all the advanced tech put together. It's kind of like the idea of like, oh, here's your lion art, here's your coloring, and then here's all the, you know, the finishing touches. So once again, route-wise, we're going to go straight in this door. Uh, we're going to be grabbing the rock once again up this hill. Uh, we want to make sure that one thing that we're doing whenever we have movements going is we have our cursor being where we want it to be. Uh, that is kind of one of the big things of point and clicks. Uh, just, you know, precursor things. Uh, this could be for different rooms, could be for different, like, areas. Like, if you have something that you need to do immediately while an action is happening, just prepare that. Uh, right now, uh, we are now going to be able to do the glitch. We're going to run here once again. Oh, I went a little bit early. That's fine. Uh, luckily, if it does mess up, you can just hit continue. Uh, ideally, if you mess up, though, you'd reset the whole run, but we're, we're going to hit continue for continue's sake. I just jumped the gun a little early on the turn, I think. Which, by the way, if you're having trouble with the glitch, I recommend keeping the turn longer. Uh, it gives you more of a generosity of the the major point you can hit. As well, I talked about earlier, but there was lag reduction or input buffering. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna start doing that. And the reason why we wanna do that trick is I'm moving the box is because then at this point, I'm gonna start alternating the run and the item so I can then move past the box that I know for a fact's in the way. Uh, we're gonna continue moving. Keep in mind, you're gonna have to be able to do input buffering, lag reduction uh, to get to that point. And then you wanna do the glitch off camera just randomly because you know it's gonna be there. Uh, we'll continue doing this because reducing lag in rooms is good. Going back to the car, go back to the garage. And then we don't actually want to do it too much in the last room. You maybe want to do it maybe once or twice max. Because you do need Jennifer to be at a very particular line here. Uh, which is you really want to make sure that you are getting the key while the camera is uh, shifting. Uh, ideally, you would want to land the taxi glitch so you can just immediately start moving. Not the end roll if you miss it though. Uh, I keep missing the second one. There's two ways of doing it. You know, just tap one and two together, or you can mash. Mashing can be nice, but it comes with issues. Really, it's preference-based. Uh, and then that is a full run of it done altogether. However, I do have one more thing to add in, and it's kind of where this category really gets its meat. So, the big thing now, you may have noticed something, and I bet you're, I bet you're wondering, why is this category so difficult? Because this category is pretty difficult once you start getting further and further into it. There is a hard mode. Even in a two-minute category, there's three areas. We have the general tutorial, we had it all together, and now we have hard mode. There's one more thing that adds into that, and it's going to be kind of why this, where the expert mode of the category comes from. So there's one trick I've been ignoring so far, just to show you, and that is going to be the idea of maximizing your input buffering. 
Um, if you're going for record, uh, you will need to do this at least to a minor point. So, you may have noticed there's one area I haven't been doing input buffering or lag reduction, which is right when we enter this room. Uh, you know, you might be thinking, can I do that? Yes, it's difficult because uh, if you truly want to maximize your time, you will have to, I'll attempt it, I'm not going to get it. You will have to do it without seeing. Uh, there is a strategy I do here, which makes it a little bit easier, uh, which is still decently quick. We'll have to continue. But what you can do just to save a little bit of time while still having it be manageable is you can do about maybe five or six of these. Uh, I'll put Jennifer a little bit more forward and then you can see her model and you can see the tree. I, I did mess up there on the, the second half of that. But the thing is, if you were able to do this the entire time, you would save maybe a second or two. Uh, it's a minor amount of time, however, in a category that's about maybe two minutes, it becomes pretty massive. So not only would you be putting everything together, you would also need to add in uh, lag reduction right in the beginning of the spot. Even having Jennifer on the front end can be a little bit tougher, because your reaction time is just, you know, more rough. Uh, anyway, we are going to finish it up right now, and uh, time will come once we do the last little thing here. But this is something I want to show off along with uh, anding. Uh, while I do like anding as a category a lot, I do understand that to fill time on the, uh, the show here, I did want to give you a little something more than just beating a ending. Uh, which, it's not every day you get to see kind of a showcase of an ending and why it works. Uh, realistically, this category, I think the world record is like a 150 flat or a 151. Uh, it's pretty short. And it's a pretty easy category to get into speedrunning. Uh, that being said, uh, for Clock Tower, only Japanese copies are, unfortunately, allowed for speedrunning this game. Um, we have done some work on the moderation side where we noticed that uh, certain emulated versions in this game did have issues. Uh, and it's funny enough, it's because of this category why they had issues. Uh, we found that certain um, ports of the game, because uh, there's actually fan-made ports back in the day, or there'd be like an English cartridge that was unofficial. Uh, certain ports of the game, though, that were not official, they actually didn't realize there was a death in the courtyard. And that's how you can kind of tell, like, oh, uh, how much do they know about Clock Tower? They don't know about the death in the courtyard. And what happens is you just run through there, and then it doesn't happen. And it's like, no, there's a whole death there. You can't skip it, but you're not meant to. Anyway, time. But yeah, I really hope you enjoy the showcase of Clock Tower. Uh, it is a game that I always love showing off. It was my bit of a bit of a baby of my game. Um, it's probably the one I've ran the longest at this point. I've been speedrunning Clock Tower since longer than I've been streaming and longer than a lot of things, probably since, like, early 2017 for me. Uh, I've been speedrunning Clock Tower longer than I've known about GDQ. That's how long I've been doing this game. So, I really hope you enjoyed that. It's not every day I get to show you a game like this. Uh, if you do want to see more like it or any more games in general, uh, I've been at Dices. Uh, on the runner side, you can check me out at that. Uh, anyway, I do want to say thank you for indulging me in that. And with that, we are at the end of our show. Uh, we had a fun few games for you here. Uh, nice going into some of the retro rarities. Uh, in the next show, uh, I'll find a couple of games put together with Super Ghosts and Goblins. We'll be having that. Uh, but that being said, I do want to say thank you all for watching. Speeders of the Crypt is always fun to showcase a variety of different horror games. Uh, and hopefully you will enjoy many more that we have coming on. Uh, as well, tomorrow we're going to be having the first step, followed by As Seen on TV, starting at 7 p.m. EST. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and have a wonderful rest of the day and or night. Take care. <laughs>